morning, everybody. I'd like to call to order the January 15th morning meeting of the Board of Supervisors. We could have a roll call, please. Good morning, Happy New Year. Supervisor, uh, I'm, oh, am I not on? I think you are. Hello, okay. <laughs> Supervisor Leopold. Here. Coonerty. Here. Caput. McPherson. Here. Chair Friend. Here, if you could join us in a brief moment of silence in the Pledge of Allegiance. Mr. Palacios, are there any changes to today's agenda? Uh, yes, there are a number of changes to the agenda. On the regular agenda, item 11, there's additional materials, a replacement, uh, attachment F, packet page 39. On the consent agenda, item 16, additional materials, there's a revised memo and packet uh, replacement packet page 66. <laughs> Item 37, uh, staff requests that this item be deleted. Item 46, there's a correction. The item should read, schedule a public hearing on January 29th, 2019 at 9 a.m. or thereafter to consider amendments to the unified fee schedule, reducing the fee for year-round special event organizi organizer from $380 to $190 for events concurrent with certified farmers markets and take related actions as recommended by the Director of Health Services. There's also uh, additional materials. There's a, a revised memo packet pages 432 and 433 on this item. That concludes the uh, corrections to the agenda. Thank you. I'll now ask if there's any supervisor who'd like to pull an item from consent. I'll walk through. Supervisor Caput, any item you want to pull from consent today? Supervisor McPherson? Coonerty and Leopold, nothing from consent, okay. We'll now open it up to public comment. It's an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda but are within the purview of the Board of Supervisors. Any item that's on the consent <coughs> agenda, any item that's on the regular agenda if you're unable to stay. We don't actually have a closed session uh, item today but this would also be your opportunity uh, normally for you to comment on that as well. So please feel free to step forward. You'll have three minutes. Good morning, welcome back. Good morning. My name is Michael Spadafora. I'm the owner of Java Junction. I've been here several times now. I think this problem's been going on for about two months. I want to make sure nobody forgets about what's happening, and I don't think you guys can, what's happening up at the Ross Camp. On a daily basis, we have the employees, the customers, the owners go through constant pain in the ass things that we go through. Um, the owner of Sawyer Chiropractic Clinic owns his business. He just had two people turn down leasing spots in his unit. Um, mattress discounters just call for hazmat to clean up puke and feces on the side of their building. The city put up a fence for us to fence off the river levee from our area, but the fence was clipped together at the top. The bottom, I mean, people open the fence, we only have fence maintenance between 9 and 10 a.m. After that, the fence is breached about 10.30 every day, and people walk up and down the levee again, which, which was great because some family needed to get back to the other side of the levee. They were on their bicycles, so the woman opened the gate. The two kids rode through the um, gate, and they closed the gate again. So it's actually a gate. It's not even a fence. I don't know if you guys know it, but there's probably about 200 tents there now. And those people are all in the rain. There's four bathrooms. I don't think there's a health code that allows, because I know if you owned a restaurant, if you had seats for 200 people, you would need more than four toilets. So there's four toilets. There's about 200 tents, probably about 400 people, and it's all in the rain. I don't know what is going into the soil. I don't know what is going into the sidewalks where my customers are. I mean, all during the Christmas season, because the last time I was here, we spoke was probably mid-December. Uh, but we have, uh, on a daily basis, I got cars being uh, raided for drugs. You know, I got cops with guns drawn. I got ambulances. I got uh, the manager of PetSmart coming up to me. I got the manager of Ross coming up to me. I got the manager of Office Max. I mean, we're all at our wits end. I mean, it's just all our sales are down and it's just a nightmare. 
So any help you guys can do with the city because the city seems to be overwhelmed with this. Nobody we talk to really has an idea of what you guys are gonna do. But on a daily basis, this gets worse and worse and worse. And there's no alleviation, there's nothing. We put up a $15,000 fence, they've cut it now. We just paid to have it uh, rep repaired yesterday. They cut it twice overnight. I mean, it's just, you know, we're all, we all spend a lot of money to have our businesses there. I've talked enough. If you guys can do our help us, that'd be great. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else during the public comment time? Good morning and welcome. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Tori Del Favro, and I'm with the U.S. Census Bureau. And I'm actually based in Capitola, and I serve Monterey, San Benito, and Santa Cruz County. And today, I am calling a census hat trick because on um, the agenda for Monterey, San Benito, and Santa Cruz County is a resolution supporting the 2020 census. So currently I'm working with county staff here in Santa Cruz. We've got Peter that's doing a great job and his staff that's helping out. I look forward to having a robust, um, I look forward to having a robust complete count committee with the County of Santa Cruz. Most of you know the importance of the decennial census and what it means for federal dollars in this community. We can go down the list with Section 8 housing, with Medicaid, with Title I funds, with Head Start. There's so many programs that federal funding touches and our goal is to have a complete and accurate count here in Santa Cruz County and we absolutely need the board's support to make that happen and I appreciate your support. Um, Peter has my contact information. If you can think of constituents <coughs> that um, it would be helpful, trusted voices in the community that I can reach out to, that I can touch with, that I can meet with that would help us um, push into our hard to count populations. I would appreciate you passing along my contact information. You know the people in the community, you know the people that are the trusted voices in the areas that you serve, um, and you know how important the census is. So even though it seems far away, it will be here before we know it. So I truly would appreciate you guys helping myself out. Again, my uh, role is a partner special, partnership specialist, which is communications and outreach with the Census Bureau, and um, it's vital that that we get the messaging out early on how important the census is. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your support. Thanks for your work. Thank you. And I, I also uh, just saw that the federal judge has ruled against the citizenship question. Uh, I don't think that'll uh, uh, solve it, uh, the uh, problems we have associated with that question. Uh, I think it'll go to the Supreme Court, but uh, it's, that's a good first uh, shot at, at, in the courts. So hopefully that'll help us with our complete count. Anybody else during public comment? Good morning. Yeah, morning. Before I pivot into my public comment, I want to remind members of the public what it is to be a good flag waving Americans because we are good people. I truly believe that. There's good men and women that do run the system and I want to be able to tell them th uh, uh, thank you. But I want to be able to speak to the Mexicans in this county. What's good for a Mexican is good for a Latino. What's good for a Mexican is good for a Hispanic. What's good for a Mexican is good for a people of color. And in this community, right, I want to be able to share with members of the public because I dialogue with a lot of Mexicans and people of color. And they're telling me that the DA office is a corrupt uh, institution that's constantly using uh, their powers for nefarious means to oppress. Today I got a malicious prosecution and Alan Timberlake is laughing because she thinks it's funny oppressing me, right? And I want to be able to share with members of the public that the DA, which is right there, and I have every right to my First Amendment, and I'm gonna exercise those rights. I have every right to criticize you, and I, I'm not ashamed of my humanity. I wanna be able to share with members of the public the malicious prosecution. They're consolidating two cases, First Amendment. Now, when you criticize your government, what they wanna do is they wanna criminalize political dissent, and which is shameful. They consolidate two cases and they have no case. They withhold excorporatory evidence from the sheriff department. He has a body cam. Then they, w they try to get me for resisting arrest. In this dirt bag, they didn't provide the, the excorporatory evidence, so they dropped the charges, right? Prosecutorial misconduct is three years in state prison. I'm being maliciously prosecuted, and today I gotta go to court to deal with it. It's a kangaroo court. My a public defender is acting as a surrogate prosecutor. There's constantly missteps, and it's all meant for the political machination to try to convict me on crap. 
We're tired of the abuse of political power. We're not gonna, my activism doesn't stop at the door. This community needs to understand that, hey, our, hum, our, our rights matter. So they dropped the charge. Now Emily, Alan Timberlake and Emily Bali are imposing this arbitrary rule. Just, just address us. You can this arbitrary rule, this is a political arena. And these are members that I can't go to their agency to complain and criticize them. You are healing administrators that do nothing. I have to come in here and vent my political frustration, but this is resonating with a lot of people. And we're tired of the abuse of political power. If you're going to be a healing administrator, why don't you go take the document and tell them, hey, stop politically oppressing him. Tell the DA's office to clean up their mess and stop funding them. And tell them, hey, stop oppressing segments of the political community. Justice is a war and element. Spirited men are going to stand up for their democracy, for their freedoms, and for their liberties. Thank you. Is there anybody else that would like to address us during public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board for uh, the consent agenda. Are there any comments that would that uh, you'd like to make on the consent agenda, Supervisor Caput? No, Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I'd like, uh, I'd like to. Uh, is that on? <coughs> no. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'd like to um, uh, address uh, several issues. Uh, item number 18 on the legislative agenda. It's on the consent agenda. I want to thank each of our departments for their thoughtful and thorough list of. Uh, legislative priorities for 2019. It's great to see that each priority is tied to one of our strategic plan elements as well. Uh, we have a new governor, new legislature. Um, interesting, he, I, I was uh, overall impressed with uh, what the new governor had, had to say. Um, state's in good shape for the time being, at least in a fiscal matter, but uh, I think it, uh, this also highlights how difficult it is to tackle these issues in one legislative session, and it'll be more interesting with the new legislature, new governor, but uh, I think as uh, we work through the California State Association of Counties, uh, uh, we can advocate and do a very good job. We have a great uh, team effort up there in Sacramento. On item number 31, uh, Margaret Niven, uh, an appointment of Arts Commission. This is a stellar person for us to have. Uh, she's an accomplished artist and teacher who lives at the Tannery Arts Center, and I just want to welcome her to the Arts Commission. Um, it's a very important issue in this community. On item uh, number 34, the Monterey Bay uh, Community Power Board appointment. Um, since uh, launching last March, uh, Monterey Bay Community Power has paid off all of its startup debt while still providing 100% carbon-free energy at 3% less than uh, PG&E rates. Uh, we have also formed uh, a community advisory board to assist the policy and operations boards uh, regarding fu future in, uh, investments in our region and are now building reserves which should reach uh, $150 million in the next few years. As well, we are going to reach our 2030 state uh, mandated greenhouse gas emission reductions uh, this year, in 2019. Um, it's been a really a con incredible success story, which has been a tremendous collaborative effort among 16 cities, and soon to be 18 when San Luis Obispo and Morro Bay uh, cities uh, join us this uh, in uh, 2020. Um, and I, it's been a privilege to be the chair of that policy board uh, for the past 18 months, and I want to thank the, the board for the confidence it has in, in me and Monterey Bay Community Power as it's uh, been developed and uh, really done the job that it said it was going to do. On item number 44, the in-home support services rate change package submittal to the California Department of Social Services, we have been working on that issue here, and I think it's one of the most important issues in the California state budget that is, uh, uh, as you know, um, the Human Resources and Health Services Departments has been making this uh, rate change that we want to have a reality. Um, this fiscal burden that our county faces and every other of the other 57 counties uh, is really something that's looming over our heads, but uh, again, with the governor having addressed it in his budget recommendation, I am really confident that we can uh, balance this so it doesn't really have a financial burden on us and we can provide the services that are were needed uh, for uh, for the people who really uh, depend on this in-home support services that we have 
Um, the, on item number 49, we've been away for a while, so I just wanted to get a couple <laughs> of these, but uh, uh, this last weekend I was uh, up at a, a meeting on uh, the water management basin and then went over to the, f the um, new library that is bu building, um, uh, being built in Felton. Uh, they were pouring the concrete for the foundation, and uh, so I want to thank uh, everybody for that support system, especially those the voters in Measure S in 2016. Uh, but uh, we, we also have now received a grant uh, that uh, back in May, and so I want to repeat my appreciation to the Parks Department and Director Jeff Gaffney for applying and getting this $400,000 uh, grant. Uh, it's going to be one of, a f probably the first of its kind in the state where we have a library and an interpretive uh, park right next door. So it's great to see that all coming together. And on item number 54, the uh, winter storm updates. Um, you know, not a week goes by where we don't see, my office hears about the status of roads or people saying, when are you gonna do mine? Uh, we have to, to do what we can do to speed up. I think our public works department has done a fantastic job with the resources it has. But we need to ask our members of Congress to assist us with uh, FEMA and the Federal Highway Authority so we can get these projects moving along. Uh, there's a, a big issue of funding in those areas that uh, has really held back our efforts to really get some of those projects done, but we're gonna keep working on it, and I wanna thank the Public Works Department for the job it has done with the resources, the financial resources it has over since those 2016-17 storms, and uh, I guess we're gonna be headed into another one over this week, but uh, the Public Works Department's done a fantastic job with the mo monetary resources it has, and I wanna thank them for the job that well done. Thank you. Thank you, Supervisor McPherson. Good morning, Supervisor Coonerty. Hi. <coughs> Good morning. Uh, just a couple items to comment on. Uh, on item number 17, uh, thank you for the outreach, and I look forward to working with you and my fellow board members to make sure that everyone in Santa Cruz County is counted per, as per the Constitution. Uh, and I was also very happy with their ruling this morning, uh, which is an important step uh, for uh, fairness and protection uh, in our country. On item number 18, our legislative program, um, it does cover, uh, it's got a lot of good programs in there. I spoke to the CAO yesterday about whether we can narrow down our focus to a couple key goals and then meet with our legislature, legislators and, and really try to work to get those goals advanced um, and uh, as well as our advocates both in Washington DC and in Sacramento. And so um, thinking about how we can make sure we, we're being heard in a, in a large state, in a large country, to make sure our priorities are being, meet, are being met. Uh, and finally, on item number 50, uh, which is a report from the uh, planning department about building permits uh, and the times it's taking to process them. First of all, I wanna appreciate the report is informative and good, and I've, <coughs> the tracking is excellent. Uh, I really am excited about this PRIMO process, which is looking at all of our processes and figuring out you know, who needs to see what and when and why so that we can process them faster. Uh, I think this the board reduced the fees for both solar and ADUs um, in an effort to match our community's values and policy goals. But uh, one of the things I said when we lowered the solar fees was I didn't wanna do the same amount of work for less. I wanted us to re-envision the process uh, so that we're meeting the end goal, which is to make sure that solar systems are installed safely. Uh, but not uh, not trying to do it through the sit with all the same people along the way. So can we um, can we look at certified installers going back and spot, spot checking? Can we look at other ways uh, to make sure these systems are safe, but without the same amount of staff time? I think the pre mail process is a really good effort, and and will uh, allow us to reduce some of these permitting times and uh, and take some of the burdens off staff as they're trying to get through these many, many applications. Thank you, good morning, Supervisor Leopold. Uh, good morning, Chair. Um, I just have a couple of things. There's just some additional language I wanted to add to the legislative program on number 18. Um, it has to do with the transportation, housing, and land use piece. Uh, the first item on there talks about SB1 and Measure D and the need for additional funds on top of that. But I wanted to add a line that said the county opposes adding additional mandates in order to access the SB1 funding. You know, there have been some discussion that they're gonna try to make a, the additional ways in which we, uh, things we have to do in order to get that funding. 
but the voters here in Santa Cruz uh, uh, by a 75% margin uh, turned back Prop 6 because they want to access these funds. So I have this written down for you. Uh, also, uh, just a little bit further down the page, uh, when it comes to the housing and homeless, it says the county supports legislative actions or programs that increase affordable housing through density bonuses and similar measures aimed at addressing the housing shortfall. And I would just add a comma saying prioritizing transit-oriented development while retaining local control over land use choices. Um, I think this goes along, you know, uh, with, uh, with what we've been trying to do. Uh, and I think the land use decisions are best made at a local level and you would be hard pressed to, to point out where we haven't done our job here. Uh, this board hasn't done its job here. So uh, the other items that I'll just uh, uh, briefly uh, comment on is item number 43, which is the uh, report on the Blaine Street uh, jail facility. We're gonna be having an item about the, uh, from the Justice and Gender Task Force later on today that'll talk about issues about women in the criminal justice system. I wanna appreciate the work of staff to provide a broad range of programming for the women who are in the Blaine Street uh, facility. Uh, I'm glad to see that, uh, that facility reopened and in use for women as our only uh, dedicated uh, facility for women um, uh, in our criminal justice system. Uh, on item number 50, I think there has been good work. This is about the uh, uh, continuing process improvement around the uh, permitting functions. There, this report details good work. Um, I know that we all got a, 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 a note from a constituent talking about how long it's taking to get simple permits out of the planning department and whatever we can do to help uh, speed this along, even in the documentation here for a simple remodel permit, the, the num number of days that someone has to wait for a permit is a lot. Um, and so I, I, I encourage uh, the committee to keep on working to reduce these uh, delays uh, to allow people to do especially uh, fairly straightforward uh, projects. On item number 54, uh, th this is uh, as we head into the rainy season, um, trying to remember our 2017 uh, storm damage, uh, it's still present and uh, we get concerns and I know uh, uh, Mr. Machado and I went up to the summit area recently for a meeting and uh, we looked at some of the roads um, some of them we did great work and some of them we're still waiting to do great work. Uh, and I would encourage us to really engage our legislative partners um, in Congress uh, to help us out here. And I appreciate the letters that have been sent in addition and I think they should be copied to our legislative um, uh, team uh, because we need their help. And uh, with the changeover in the House of Representatives, our congressional members have, a, they have more power than they did last year. So it's, it's a good uh, opportunity to take advantage of it. And with that, I'm done. Uh, thank you. I don't have anything to add beyond what has actually been said specifically on item 54, and I appreciate the work of Public Works during the difficult uh, rebuilding process. Uh, if we could get a motion for the amended uh, consent agenda. I would move the amended uh, uh, consent agenda. Second. A motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor Coonerty. All those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? That passes unanimously. We'll move on to the first item of the regular agenda, which is to consider the selection of chairperson and vice chairperson for the calendar year 2019, as outlined in a memo of your current chair. Uh, we have, uh, in accordance with our standard procedures, nominated or requested uh, that the board consider Supervisor Coonerty for chair and Supervisor Caput as vice chair. I appreciate the opportunity to serve as chair for all of you uh, this last year, but I will happily hand it over to uh, a new chair. So, uh, I would make that motion uh, uh, to appoint uh, Supervisor Coonerty as chair and Supervisor Caput as vice chair. So we do have a motion from Supervisor Leopold and a second from Supervisor McPherson. Anybody from the community would like to address us on the chairmanship? Good morning, uh, Mr. Yeah, I wanna be able, yeah, I wanna be able to share with members of the public. The political conflict, these are real conflicts. We need to sit down with the threat from down below leadership and we need to be able to negotiate uh, a better deal. Because when it comes to community justice for people of color, we're not getting it here, right? The judges are corrupt, right? And, and what, I, what I'm gonna ask is that, hey, well, let's give uh, Caput a, a chance to run it. I, I gotta say this, under your leadership, man, you, well, you're putting a bull in our public comment, and I don't appreciate <laughs> it. Thank you. Okay, so Supervisor Caput is nominated for vice chair. That's what the item, uh, the recommendation was. Anybody else like to put a motion, any, are there any other nominations? 
There's no other public comment, I assume. There's no other nomination, so we'll vote on the nomination. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Congratulations, Supervisor Kundry. I'll switch spots with you. The peaceful transfer of power. <laughs> the Russians did it. <laughs> <laughs> it's not official until I switch the Uh, so let me just uh, take a moment and thank my colleagues. I've served uh, four years, so I've had the opportunity to serve under every one of uh, my colleagues as chairs, and this, this will be my first time. Uh, my commitment to uh, this county is to continue the leadership uh, that my colleagues have shown and that the staff have shown uh, in a real commitment to solving problems and getting things done for our community. Uh, Unfortunately, I'm, it seems to be a little bit rare these days at uh, many levels in government to have, uh, to have a collegiality uh, and a commitment to, uh, to service and to getting things done, uh, but I'm going to do my best to make sure that the county continues, uh, continues its, its efforts and leadership over the years. And that brings us to our next uh, agenda item, which I think really fits within that theme, which is the presentation of awards to the first graduating class of the Santa Cruz County Leadership Training Program known as LEAP, which stands for Learn, Engage, Apply, and Perform, as outlined in the memorandum from the CAO. Uh, so uh, when Carlos Palacios was selected as CAO, uh, one of his real emphasis, uh, one of the areas he wanted to really emphasize was supporting the tremendous talent we have in Santa Cruz County, developing the next generation of leaders, and working to make sure those leaders worked across the departments to build relationships and trust with each other, a common language. Um, he recommended to us that we create a three-year uh, program uh, to support these leaders, and this is the first class who have gone through the classes uh, to look at continue, con <coughs> continuous process improvement, performance measurement, strategic planning. Uh, we're already seeing the fruits of those labors uh, play out, and uh, it's a really exciting time to be able to invest in, in our, our most valuable resource as an institution, which is our people. Um, the first graduating class has completed the program, and we'd like to, call, to honor them by presenting them certificates of completion. I'm going to ask the, uh, we're going to name the graduates uh, and as by name and department, and we're going to ask them to come up and stand in front of the room. Uh, and so I'm going to start by asking uh, Andrew Stewart from the Human Services Department to come forward. Then I'll uh, ask Beatriz Barranco from the Department of Public Works. Carol Johnson from the General Services Department. Carolyn Burke, Planning Department. Chris Clark, Sheriff's Department. Jason Heath, our County Council. Jessica Randolph from the Health Services Agency. Juan Hidalgo from the Office of the Agricultural Commissioner. Mary Chavez, Parks, Open Spaces, and Cultural Services. Nisha Patel, Personnel. Paya Levine from the Planning Department. And Tara George from the District Attorney's Office. And uh, will you please join me as we give our first LEAP Leadership Academy graduating class a round of applause. And uh, so now um, I'm going to ask you, well, you can return to your seats, but now you're going to get a lot of good things said about you. Uh, uh, things to give out. Oh, sorry, we have uh, proclamations to give you, and then we'll, then we'll, then we'll say good things. <laughs> As we're doing this, uh, I think this class is going to be enlarged to 30 people next year, so that is just uh, that much better. So we're going to probably have a class of three times the size next year. And uh, it's, uh, I think it's a tremendous um, move by our, our county administrative officer to have this uh, program here in Santa Cruz County. And uh, I really want to congratulate each and every one of you and thank you for the time and commitment that you have made. Uh, this word is going to spread throughout our 20, what, 300, 400 employees in Santa Cruz County. 
I will add that I appreciate uh, the, uh, the time that staff is giving uh, to this program. I appreciate the leadership from our county administrative officer to, to establish this kind of program, <laughs> to invest in our workforce, uh, and to try to get people to thinking uh, out of their silos and working together uh, on uh, critical issues. So thank <laughs> you for your work. And I'll just briefly add that I think that it really speaks to uh, the creation of a new culture and a, and a new day within the County of Santa Cruz, and uh, you really are at the forefront of exactly that. It's something that the board has sought, but really, realistically, it's something that all of you actually asked us to bring back forward to you. This was something that was uh, driven from all of you at the beginning. And uh, when I look out, actually, at all of you, I recognize that we are looking at uh, remarkable leaders within our workforce. And as Supervisor Chair Coonerty had said, uh, it starts and ends really with the work that all of you do. So thank you. I'll just add in, uh, in my comments that uh, when I took uh, this position, uh, I envisioned a day when we'd have our first class of graduates, and here you are, so it's like a dream come true for me. I really do appreciate the effort that each of you put into this. I know that they took uh, 10 classes in Sacramento, five classes on site, a total of 15 classes, uh, completed the credential for Institute for uh, Excellence in County Government from CSAC. Uh, it's a lot of effort, and I really do appreciate it, and you guys, you, you folks are, are all uh, going to be the forerunners of what I hope is going to be many years of graduates in, in the years to come. So thank you, each of you very much for your efforts. I appreciate it. So uh, we have a reception out in the hallway uh, under the, the long known wisdom that if you can feed them, you can lead them. Uh, and uh, so uh, we're gonna take a uh, 15 minute recess uh, and join and invite everyone to join uh, out in the hallway to celebrate our LEAP graduates and then we'll be back um, at what, 9.50. Okay, okay, perfect. A short, yeah, good public. <laughs>
definitely helps. Um, wait, wait. Oh, hold on. Thank you. Uh, we will call the meeting back to order and we will move to agenda item number nine, which is a public hearing to consider the activity, uh, consider activities and authorize submittal of a 2018 C Community Development Block Grant CDBG application to the state of California, adoption of a resolution authorizing staff to apply for 28 C CDBG funds and related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the planning director. And we have a presentation for us today. Good morning, board members. Priscilla Wilson and Suzanne Ise from the housing staff. Uh, before we get started, I do want to let everybody know we have a sign-up sheet at the rear of the chambers and we'd appreciate it if everybody signed in for records. The 2018 State Community Development Block Grant Notice of Funding Availability was released on November 1st, 2018. Applications are now due on February 26th. That's an extension from the original date, which was February 5th. Eligible jurisdictions such as the county can apply for up to $3 million um, in one or more activities. Activities must meet one of the national objectives. All county proposals um, we received currently meet the number one, which is the benefit to lower income people or individuals. The county has gone through the required process and held two public meetings where only one is required. One before the Housing Advisory Commission and one before the board, both were held in November. Three proposals were received. Staff recommends all for inclusion in the county's application. The first two proposals are public capital projects, and the last one is for a planning grant. I will be going into a little more detail on each of these. Staff's recommendation for inclusion of the two capital projects in the county's application increases the chances of funding. The planning grant will be automatically awarded if either of the two capital projects are awarded. The first proposal is for the Live Oak Community Health Center, which would replace the current East Cliff Health Clinic. The new health center is part of the mixed-use project being developed by Midpen Housing at 1500 Capitola Road in Live Oak. Santa Cruz Community Health Centers is requesting $2 million, or I'm sorry, $3 million. Staff is recommending $2,479,000, and that is to allow for the inclusion of the two other proposals as part of the county's application. The new health center will increase the capacity in assisting more clients annually. The center serves primarily lower-income clients, which qualifies it for CDBG funding. The second proposal is for the 18-unit Hardinas del Valle apartment rehabilitation project. The apartments are 100% affordable and rehabilitation includes interior and exterior work. This project does not expect temporary or permanent relocation of the tenants. The third and final proposal is by the Davenport Sanitation District. The district is requesting $100,000 and that is for a planning and technical assistant grant to perform a water feasibility study. Planning grants are not scored and are awarded if either of the other two capital projects are awarded. Staff recommends you take, your board take the following actions. Number one, hold a public hearing to consider the proposed county application under the state's community development block grant 2018 notice of funding availability. Number two, consider and select activities from the proposal submitted for inclusion in the county CDBG as recommended by staff for the public facility Live Oak Community Health Center for $2,479,000, under housing rehabilitation Hardinas del Valle for $421,000, and planning and technical assistance Davenport domestic water feasibility study for $100,000. Number three, adopt the resolution authorizing staff to apply for the 2018 CDBG funds for the selected proposals, and four, direct staff to notify your board of the results of the application evaluation as soon as the 2018 CDBG awards are announced by the state. Staff and representatives for each proposal are available should you have any questions, and this concludes staff's presentation. Thank you so much. Are there questions from board members? Supervisor Caput. You bet. Uh, thank you. It's good to see this for the uh, Hardinas de Valle housing uh, uh, project on Murphy Road. And uh, I think it's going to be a, you know, a great benefit to, it's a lot of migrant families there. And uh, 
uh, years ago, it was really run down, and uh, that, that was years ago, and it's been uh, improved and changed over the past about 10, 12 years. So it's good to see that uh, the families are actually living there, and, and it's a, you know, a good place to live. With the uh, asphalt project, uh, do you know uh, how big of an area that they're going to actually do in the front part there where it slopes down? Right now it's pretty much uh, gravel. Yeah. So but, the, uh, the proposed uh, scope of work just includes repairing the existing asphalt paving on the site. So it would just be patching, smoothing cracks and that sort of thing. Um, it doesn't um, include adding any new areas to be paved. Right. Uh, but the area uh, that's going to be improved, uh, they're going to redo the whole part, or they're going to just do potholes? Um, I think it would be best if the applicant um, answered questions of that level of detail. So she's, yeah, she's available. She'll speak during the public hearing, and she can address the question at that time. Thank you very mm -hmm. much. Supervisor McPherson? Yeah, I, I just want to repeat. This is a, a good set of projects, a great set of projects for the, the CDBG. Um, uh, application and it's I think it's terrific that they're spread throughout the county the north middle and south county and I'd like to thank the planning department and those public uh, community service partners who helped with this application process uh, it's going to help literally thousands of people and I want to thank you very much for a job well done and I think we're going to be very successful in getting these grants Supervisor Leopold uh, thank you uh, this is a very exciting list of projects, and I would just point out that uh, the one for the Live Oak Community Health Center uh, is part of a project in which this board has prioritized by dedicating land uh, for this activity, uh, by meeting several of our strategic goals around health, um, by uh, supporting um, both the other clinic that will be on, on uh, the site and the 57 units of affordable housing. Uh, so we should be doing everything we can to support this application because it helps us um, uh, achieve so many of our goals. And I appreciate the leadership of the Santa Cruz Community Health Centers in, in having a vision for being involved in the Mid-County, for being uh, an effective safety net clinic, and being a leader in helping improve the outcomes for families uh, in Live Oak. It has made a tremendous difference in the clinic in which they operated just four, f five years ago, I guess it opened. Um, they've already made a huge difference in the lives of so many people, and uh, they've been a great partner with the county, with the school district, with other community-based nonprofits. I just appreciate their leadership, and I look forward to voting on this proposal. Ditto. Um, so uh, this is the opportunity now for public, the public to comment on this item. Uh, anyone who's interested in item, and commenting, if you can, please stand and um, come to the microphone. Good morning. My name is Aditi Mahmoud. I am with Midpen Housing Development Corporation, and I'm here to discuss the Hardiness Del Via project, the 18 units affordable housing property uh, for very low, low income farm workers who've been there for for a long time. Um, Supervisor um, Caput asked, you asked about um, the asphalt um, that we um, have presented on the application. We would like to repair areas of, uh, um, of the asphalt just, be, just to bring it up to safety, uh, safety condition and make sure that um, there's no trip or hazard from any of the residents there. Okay. okay. And uh, a few years back, uh, they replaced the uh, pump, the water tank. Correct, correct. It's a, it runs on a sewage about. system, so they've done quite a bit of capital improvement work for that reason. You bet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Hi, Leslie Connor with Santa Cruz Community Health Centers. I just wanted to uh, thank you for considering our project. It's a really exciting um, project that combines uh, medical health, behavioral health, oral health, a partnership with Dientes right there on the um, campus, and 57 units of affordable housing. So it's a really exciting uh, convergence of a lot of social and health and uh, community needs uh, that hasn't been done before in the community. Uh, it expands access to to um, almost uh, 3,500 people and uh, improving outcomes for um, vulnerable homeless uh, individuals. We're a health care for the homeless grantee. Um, also for other complex adults with substance abuse and mental health issues and uh, in increasingly uh, a strong pediatric program to help us prevent um, uh, childhood traumas and childhood conditions from escalating and becoming those complex problems that we see and older adults that are really hard to address. So we're really excited. We have a lot of uh, uh, community partners and early investors in the project, and we welcome working with the county, and thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Uh, Benjamin Kogan, uh, hello supervisors. I always hear the term affordable housing, but I never really know exactly what that means, um, how much the housing is going to cost and all that. Um, and then who is building these affordable housing and where does the, um, is it in the private sector or is it uh, government or is it the contractors that you hire are going to get the revenue for the rent? Um, and maybe that's been disclosed, or maybe I can just, these are just some of my concerns. Um, also, uh, in terms of our budget, make sure that we're able to do these projects in the city beautification without going in debt. Um, I know that our country's in debt, the uh, state's in debt, San Jose's in debt, and there's a little bit of debt in Santa Cruz. So having a balance is really important. Um, definitely want to acknowledge you guys for taking care of the homeless and having that as a, a, something to take care of their health and well being um, and so projects like this are uh, something that will help us um, but do we need to you know spend all the money if we can have the, the means work with what we have and um, also maybe there's a way where we could also provide health and care for homeless and a place for them to have a place to stay like pitch a tent pitch a car shelter something like that because right now it's kind of hard for people with uh, who are homeless to, to really get back on their feet so if they could park their cars get on their feet get health and well-being they can be a contribution to society and I appreciate you guys for listening and um, you know being able to hear my requests and concerns and ideas thank you thank you all right, that concludes public comment. Uh, I'll bring it back to the board for action. I would move the recommended actions. Motion by Leopold, second by Caput. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. Uh, we are going to now uh, recess until 1045 when we come back for the zone. I think it's 1030. 1030 uh, for when we'll come back for the Zone 7 board meeting and item number 11, which is the uh, Justice and Gender Task Force. Thank you.
All right. Still, good morning, everybody. We're going to call the meeting back to order. I'm going to hand it over to uh, Chair Friend of the for the Zone 7 meeting. Uh, thank you, Chair Coonerty. Uh, so I'd like to call to order the January 15th meeting of the Zone 7 Flood Control and Water Conservation District. If we could have a roll call for Zone 7, please. Directors Leopold? Here. Coonerty? Here. McPherson? Bannister? Here. Belichick? Here. And Chair Friend. Uh, here, and Director Caput's here as well. Oh, I'm sorry about that. That's okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and Thank so, you. So we'll move on to item B, which here. is consideration of late additions. Uh, Mr. Strudley, uh, is there an announcement of our new member? Yes, thank you, Chair Friend. Uh, I received a, a letter January 14th, um, just yesterday, um, uh, indicating that Dwight Lynn, uh, the representative from uh, Paro Valley Water Management Agency, um, has uh, retired and uh, PV Water would like to appoint uh, Mary Bannister as representative uh, to the Zone 7 Board of Directors. Welcome, Ms. Bannister. Ms. Bannister, as you know, had a very distinguished career in local water, including as director of PVWMA. We're glad to have you back participating in Zone 7. You've had a large role in Zone 7 historically, so I'm glad to have you back on that. Are there any additions or deletions to today's agenda? Other than that, no additions or deletions. Great. So we'll start off with oral communications for Zone 7. This is an opportunity for members of the community to address us on items that are not on today's agenda but are specifically within the purview of Zone 7. Is there anybody who'd like to address us during oral communications? The oral communication is public comment. Correct, right? For Zone 7 specifically. Issues that pertain to Zone 7, which is Pyro River Levy. Okay. So, all right. I do appreciate that. Because last time, uh, don't, don't get me wrong, last time you guys allow members of the public to do oral communication or public comment. Yeah, we, you we guys did are making, on the regular making, agenda. This is uh, specific to Zone 7, so we're acting as a different body. That's why there's different people up here. And so you're allowed to uh, comment on things that aren't on today's Zone 7 agenda, but within the purview of the body of Zone 7. So uh, flood control, water protection, specifically along the Pajaro River levee oh. area. Okay. Okay. So anybody else? Uh, seeing none, we'll move on to item two, which is approval of Zone 7 board meeting minutes. Are there any questions or changes to the minutes? I move approval. Second. Second. We have a motion uh, from Director Leopold and a second from Director Bilicich. Are there any comments from the community on the minutes? Seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Item three is as Board of Directors of the Zone of uh, Zone 7 to consider the nominations for Zone 7 Board of Directors, Chairperson and Vice Chairperson as recommended by the District Engineer, Mr. Strudley. Thank you, Chair Friend. Board of Directors, uh, in conformance with the rules and regulations of Zone 7, the Board uh, must nominate and elect a Chair and Vice Chair for 2019. Um, the Board uh, and the District has been very effectively um, managed under the incumbent Chair, and we would like to uh, request nomination of Chair Friend to continue as Chair of the District. Um, it is not in the board memo, but we would also find it valuable to have representation uh, as vice chair from the city of Watsonville. Uh, Which uh, would so mean Director Bilicich? Correct. So maintaining the current chair and vice chair? Correct. Okay. Is there, are there any other nominations? I would move the nomination of Friend and Bilicich. Second. There's a motion and a second. Is there anybody from the community who'd like to address us on the chair, vice chair for zone seven? Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Uh, moving on to item four, which is the Board of Directors of Zone 7 to adopt a resolution accepting unanticipated revenue in the amount of $213,586 and approve the transfer of funds in the amount of 18449 as recommended by the district engineer. We also have the resolution. Director Stradley. Thank you much, Chair and Board of Directors. Um, this is an administrative matter, um, very mechanical. We have received um, some reimbursements from the state as well as the federal government for storm damage projects, uh, repairs that were made from events in 2016 and 2017. Um, and due to some uh, errors uh, that I made in projections last year and anticipating that revenue last year, um, it had come in a bit late, and so we need to shuffle a small amount of funds within Zone 7 to make our funds uh, come into balance. So um, 
-hmm. We're recommending the board adopt a resolution accepting and appropriating unanticipated revenue in the amount of $213,586 from Cal OES and for reimbursement of project costs associated with repairs to district facilities from state and federally declared disasters in 2016 and 2017 and approve a transfer of funds in the amount of $18,000 449 from object 86110 buildings and improvements to object 62330 DPW services general money to achieve appropriate fund balance. Thank you for that uh, inspirational presentation. Are there, are, there, are there any questions on this administrative move? I'll make a motion to approve. Second. So we have a motion for the recommended actions from Director Bilicic and a second from Director Lee Pulling away from the community on this issue. Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. Moving on to item five, which is the direct board of directors of zone seven to award a contract in the amount of $2,499,312 to Peterson Brewstad Incorporated for program management consultant services in support of the Pajaro River flood risk reduction project and take related actions as recommended by the district engineer. We have the certificate of insurance, the ICA from Peterson Brewstad, the Peterson Brewstad revised scope budget the ADM for Peterson Brewstad and the presentation of the contract award program management all attached, Mr. Strudley. Thank you, Chair Friend, uh, Board of Directors. Um, like to direct your attention to the presentation on uh, our program management consultant selection. I'd like to dive into this right away if we could. Okay, um, so at our last board meeting in September, we requested authorization to advertise solicit proposals for program management consultant services in support of the Paha River Flood Risk Reduction Project, the Federal Army Corps Project. Um, we're coming before your board now to request um, uh, an award of contract to our preferred consultant that um, came out of that selection process. Um, before we dive into those details, I'd like to just give you a brief update on the core project to set the context. Um, we're expecting completion of the feasibility phase for the project in March of 2019, so just a few months away. Um, a feasibility report will um, be included as uh, the beginning of that phase of the project, um, and it'll be accompanied by a director's report. Um, there's a lapse in federal funding right now. Um, we were hoping for an award of fiscal year 19 work plan funds, and we will go into discussion more in a different board item on this topic, but we did not receive those funds, so we have a delay in the start of the design phase of the project. Um, our next federal funding opportunity will be the fiscal year 20 work plan funding opportunity next fall or winter. Uh, and as this project has exhibited over the last at least several years, we have ongoing questions about funding and phasing of the project. But nevertheless, there's a lot we can do in the meantime, even in the absence of federal funding, um, and that being selecting a program management consultant to help guide us in developing uh, new governance and finance strategies to support the project as well as supporting uh, the process with the core. Um, so notably, uh, this consultant would help evaluate and establish a new governance structure since the project goes across county lines and includes a very significant uh, city municipality in the area. Uh, evaluate and design locally preferred project enhancements, if we choose. Support uh, us, uh, the district, um, in project delivery from the Army Corps. Support some of the technical aspects of the CEQA process, which we will hope to embark on this year as well technical support for financing the project, uh, adopting a new rate structure to fund and design, uh, uh, fund design and construction of the project, and to inform and engage stakeholders and the public through this whole process and to re-engage them. Um, there were two consultant teams that responded to the uh, RFP. There was one that was notably heads and shoulders above the other, and that was the Peterson Brewstad team. Um, they are proposing to uh, work as the program manager and to work together with uh, Larson Wurzel and Associates on the finance and governance op uh, opportunities, Kim Floyd Communications on the public outreach and engagement, and Morrison Consulting on the property management and real property acquisition aspects of the project. <coughs> PBI um, <coughs> was head and shoulders above the other team 
not only because of their proposal and their uh, uh, thorough knowledge of core projects, but they have a very long proven track record with other flood control agencies um, who have had similar difficulties uh, as we do with um, their core projects and have successfully been able to help those flood control districts and agencies build their projects and get federal investment. Um, their references were exceptional. I went out of my way to contact others um, apart from those on their reference list and they all came back glowing. Um, they have uh, promised to commit uh, abundant resources from their team members to work with us on our project and that is something that I asked of the references as well and they did confirm that strategy that they tend to employ and that attention. Um, and they have experience in all aspects of levy improvement programs. Um, so this, this presents an opportunity to meet not only our scope, but to help us strategize to get a project successful. So what are they gonna be doing for us? Um, they're gonna be working on the governance aspects to establish a new governance structure, evaluating options and providing recommendations for us, identify actions necessary to establish that new governing body and facilitate discussions with key stakeholders and uh, work with us on necessary agreements. Um, they're gonna be working with us on the financing aspects of the project, um, develop preliminary financial plans to fund implementation, long-term ops and maintenance of the project, um, identify project beneficiaries and apportionment of local cost share for the rate structure and implementation of local funding mechanism. They're gonna be importantly working with us and the core on project delivery, um, completing hydrologic and hydraulic study aspects of the project, reviewing uh, core deliverables and the process that will unfold with the core and assisting us to navigate the very complicated um, minutia of the core policies and process that goes along with a project like this uh, and to assist with any necessary project agreements. They're gonna be working very hard with us on public outreach and engagement, a very important part of this project. Uh, they're gonna develop a coordinated public outreach plan, resolve stakeholder issues, preparation of information materials, conducting public opinion research, notably for the uh, rate structure analysis, conducting community and stakeholder meetings. And although it seems like this contract covers a lot of ground, there are some aspects that it does not cover that we will either seek uh, outside or do on our own. Those include design of locally preferred enhancements. That is an optional task with them, but not currently in the proposed contract. Um, real property acquisition full suite of hydraulic modeling necessary for the core to keep moving through the beginning of the design phase, uh, developing a governance charter, strategic plan, and implementation plan for the new governing body. Those are optional tasks under this contract. Uh, and importantly, FEMA certification um, to uh, help attract um, uh, the right kind of results that we want from this project, which is namely getting a lot of people out of having to pay FEMA flood insurance behind a newly developed project. Uh, CEQA, this is not uh, gonna be a contract to perform CEQA, uh, but they will assist with technical aspects of it. And we're not including legal examination of funding efforts, and again, we are going to seek this uh, legal expertise through a separate contract to assist in this whole governance and finance strategy. So the financial impact to the district um, uh, is steep. It is uh, expensive to undergo program management consultant services like this. Um, the fee estimate is currently just shy of 2.5 million. Um, One million dollars we have currently in unspent funds that were going to be directed to the core to match the fiscal year 19 work plans, but we were not awarded those federal funds, so we have one million dollars still available to apply towards uh, moving the project forward. Um, we have a Prop 1E grant balance of just over 1.5 million, approximately two thirds of that we are planning on dedicating towards this effort as well. Uh, we would like to fast track the governance and rate structure aspects of this program management uh, contract so that we can help meet the financial obligations of the contract under a new rate structure and, and governing body. And we still have our California subventions authorization that may be able to contribute towards implementation costs. The contract costs are gonna be spread over 3.5 years. So um, zone seven can sustain this spread of this distribution of costs and we can always pause or cancel the contract if the project goes south for whatever reason, but we are 
really not going to let that happen. This is a, a somewhat cartoony representation of how the funds, um, how the revenue for this contract uh, might uh, apply. Um, during the first year of the contract, we envision uh, a rough 50-50 split between our Prop 1E grant balance and uh, flood control district funds. Initially, they're gonna be coming from Zone 7. Um, if Monterey County Water Resources uh, Agency uh, finds themselves in a more um, opportune financial spot um, during the process of this contract, um, we hope that they would join in that cost share as well. Um, 2020, the uh, expectation is a similar 50-50 split uh, between the Prop 1E grant balance and district funds for the flood control project with invoicing being expecting to be slightly less. 2021, the costs are gonna go down a, a little bit further, but we hope to have a new revenue source through a new governing body and, and financial plan to apply to this project, and then we expect the tail end of the contract to be funded by that new revenue source. And with that, um, I would uh, recommend um, the board authorize the district engineer to select Peterson Brewstad to provide program management consultant services for the Paha River Flood Risk Management Project, to authorize the district engineer to award, negotiate, and sign contract 19D0320 with Peterson Brewstad Incorporated in the amount of $2,499,312 and extending through July 2022 and to direct staff to return with regular updates on governance and finance, public engagement and outreach, and related items associated with this contract to take place during the program manager's report on future Zone 7 agendas. And before we break for your questions and consideration, I'd like to introduce uh, Dave Peterson and Mike Roster here sitting in the first row from Peterson Brewstad, who um, with your authorization, we can invite to the dais to respond to certain questions that I may not be able to answer. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shrubley. Director Bilicic and then Director Caput, please. I just, um, first of all, I want to thank you for your research and finding the best people for, the, for this job. Um, I think it's good that we do a rate structure analysis sooner than later because we've been going on, but people have no idea what it's going to cost. And we did have meetings, and then we kind of backed up. So it'll be good to get those going again. Um, and the FEMA flood insurance, if there's any way that we can get that reduced because we hear about that all the time. People are just so upset about the fees and the insurance that they have to pay. Even though we continue to make progress, um, it doesn't fit their criteria yet. But I know we will, and I, I appreciate your leadership. I think you've done a great job, and um, I'd like to move the motion forward when it's time. When it's time, okay. Uh, Director Caput, please. You bet. Yeah, thank you for all the work you're doing. and uh, with. Is this any different than what we uh, were doing like three, four years ago, as far as uh, the fees and the consultants and all that? So what happened uh, in 2016 was uh, a governance and finance committee was established to look at uh, kind of some broad aspects to the whole governance finance strategy that would be potentially employed to support the project. Um, there were five committee meetings and then the committee was disbanded because of a lapse in federal funding and, and a hiccup on the federal side with the project. So this process is much, gonna be much more comprehensive and it will go to completion. The objective here is, is to re-engage the governance and finance committee and repopulate that committee um, and to use that committee as part of the public engagement and outreach strategy. Um, but it's going to be much more comprehensive than that in terms of developing and actually following through with developing a new governing body, a new sure. financing plan and strategy and implementation and reviewing core, core uh, deliverables. And, and this is uh, the same uh, Peterson and Bruce that uh, was uh, who we were working with before? No. No, Peterson Brewstad is, is, was not working for the district before. Okay. We had uh, Harrison Associates working on some of that work before f um, in support of the pr project. Okay. <coughs> uh, last year there was uh, kind of a lapse in, as far as getting money. Is this like a catch up by getting money from last year and also this year? So we were hoping around, uh, uh, to hear around November, December timeframe that we were gonna get the fiscal year 19 work plans. That's what you're referring to. Uh, the work plan funds from the core, that did not happen. So we do have some unspent uh, revenue that we can apply towards this project. 
um, we're gonna be in line for those work plan funds next year and we'll have to match those, but it's important um, to proceed with the project and to button up all these other loose ends that will need to be accomplished regardless of whether we have federal investment or not. And to me, it's important that we get a project built regardless of federal investment. I hope there is federal investment, but the important aspect here is to get a project built, and I think Peterson Brustad is the right uh, consultant team to help us get a successful project sure. built. And then, uh with a positive outlook, if we get the go-ahead from Army Corps and everything, uh, uh, what, if, what if we don't? Then this, uh, this money, uh, we can modify the contract? Or if, if we, well, let's, if let's say Army Corps pulls the rug like they have in the past, you know. So there's a, there's, it, it's difficult to speculate on I exactly what may happen and what decisions may be made because they're not gonna be made just by me, they're gonna be made by a whole host of different people weighing in on what direction the project should take. If there is no federal investment, I hope there's a way to figure out how to build a project with perhaps state investment. Um, and I think, again, I think Peter Brustad has, <coughs> they've, had great success with other flood control agencies in getting federal investment, but they're very smart in their uh, strategic um, <clears throat> thinking about core projects and about flood control projects in general. And so I think there's a lot of opportunity to be had w with uh, folks like PBI working on our behalf. Right, no, I, uh, <clears throat> I agree with you on that, but what I'm getting at is the contract is, uh, we'll say what, two and a half million? And uh, uh, if if uh, we don't have the federal funding, <coughs> you're saying that it would shift to going after state funding, which is uh, would not be enough to do the uh, hundred. We're we're looking at the hundred year plan, right? Yeah, I mean that will be part of the exploration process. Is if we discover that there realistically isn't going to be federal investment, then we're going to have to look for that invest investment elsewhere, and see what kind of project we can build from that investment that is available. So I guess the uh, the straight question is: uh, two and a half million is the contract, regardless of what happens in March when we get a decision. correct. Correct. Uh, um, there, if we do not have certain tasks like review of Army Corps deliverables, because the Army Corps, if the Army Corps pulls out their investment from the project, then the Army Corps won't be developing designs for the project. Someone else will have to design the project. It could be under a separate task order or contract with someone like Peterson Brustad or someone else entirely. But the objective with this project here is that this meets aspects of the project that need to happen regardless of who ends up designing the project. There's gonna need to be design review, there's gonna need to be a new governing body, there's gonna need to be a financing strategy to, to fund the project. Okay, uh, so with the contract, there, uh, there's no uh, opportunity to cancel it? No, there is, we can cancel the contract at any time. And the aspects related to the tasks um, pertaining to core review of core deliverables, that right. task would no longer be relevant. Okay. And so those costs would not probably come under this contract. Uh, uh, because we've been doing this, uh, the plans and the strategy, uh, let's go back even 10 years ago or go back seven years ago. This is very similar, right? Um, uh, I mean, it, well, hopefully we're getting closer to maybe moving forward, but uh, what I'm getting at is, uh, is this what we've been doing, like one million for the past, uh, actually 25, 30 years. So we're, we're approaching the point at which the federal government is gonna be making their investment decisions on design and construction, the big costs related to this project. And Peterson and Brustad will be with us along the way to uh, watch what happens, to advise on our activities with the Corps and how we might get a design a project that will be successfully funded um, it may mean that we change the project in some ways to make it more a more attractive federal investment. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, some of this will be answered in the next, uh, when you make a report on uh, the March, uh, we'll, I'll wait for S that. Some of it, some of it will, yeah. Okay, thank you. Director Bannister. 
Yeah, go ahead. Uh, thank you for your good work. I'm really encouraged that this work is gonna move forward now. We've been waiting a long time. Um, and I think that's a, a great job you did selecting this firm, thank you. Um, am, am I correct in that there is no, at this time, contribution anticipated for Monterey County Water Resources Agency? At this point, they're not in a position to contribute to this contract, that's correct. Is that because they don't have an equivalent Zone 7 funding mechanism? Roughly speaking, yes. Is there any uh, plan to do a presentation to either their board or Monterey County Water Resources, either Board of Supervisors or the Water Agency about this work? Because I think it's important that they're kept very aware of them not contributing and all the good work y'all are doing. Um, I'm, I'm happy to pro provide a presentation to their board. We do work with their staff very closely. They're, they've been quite engaged over the recent past. Um, my latest understanding was that they were gonna provide an update at uh, their December board meeting, which apparently got a bit derailed and didn't happen. So I'm still catching up with their staff on what kind of updating they're doing to their board. Um, their representation is is apprised of all the project developments and is aware and has been involved with the governance and finance process through the governance and finance committee in the past and they'll continue to be involved. Um, so we'll continue to work with their staff and, and see if they need us to provide an update to their board. Otherwise they may end up doing it themselves. Great, thank you. And then lastly, I just wanna emphasize the importance of Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency's College Lake project, which I know you're aware of, that that is, they're aggressively moving forward with that project, and there is a linkage between the flood project and that in terms of flows and flood flooding, so I think it's important that we communicate closely with them. Thank and, you very and much. Thank you for that, and we do continue to communicate regularly with the, the general manager at PV Water to make sure we're all both on the same page. Thank you. And then we'll open it up to the community. Are there are any members of the community that would like to address us on item five. Okay, we'll close it and bring it back. Director Bilicich. Yes, I'd like to move uh, approval of the, of the uh, hiring of um, Peterson Merced Incorporated. Second. <coughs> all right, so just to confirm, Director Bilicich, it's a motion for all the recommended all the actions. Items, yes. Okay, so there's a motion from Director Bilicich and a second from Director Leopold. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously, uh, thank you on that, and thank you to them for being here as well. Uh, moving to item six, is the Board of Directors of Zone 7 to accept and file a status update on flood control facility maintenance equipment purchase authorized in the 2018-19 supplemental budget for Department of Public Works. As recommended by the district engineer, we have the supplemental budget. We have the John Deere tractor with mower, the rodent control machine, the pickup truck <laughs> with spray system, and the pickup truck <laughs> with four-wheel drive uh, as the attachments. Director Strudley. Thank you, Chair, Board of Directors. This is just a transparency item. Um, uh, we, like, like Chair Friend said, we had $265,000 that was allocated in the budget for purchase of equipment. Um, the articulation of those expenditures in the up supplemental budget was slightly different than the um, uh, estimates and invoices for the purchase of this equipment, and so, uh, just for transparency's sake, we're making the board and the public aware um, that there were some slight differences, but the total costs st still leave um, a surplus of $15,461.78, uh, so we're still within that budgetary limit. I just noticed there's an extra comma in here, so it looks like kind of like 15 million in the executive summary. Um, it's $15,461,000 in surplus. Um, so our only recommended action is to accept and file the status update on the flood control facility maintenance equipment purchase authorized under supplemental budget request. Questions, Director Bill Such. I just wanna say I appreciate the fact that uh, Zone 7 and Public Works are working together on equipment and getting things going. I mean, you know, it's nice when there's collaboration and you're um, using r resources together. Appreciate that. They, they are, yeah, they are zone seven resources, but then they're funneled through the, the internal services fund, right. and yeah, there is a partnership there, thank you. Anybody from the community on this item? Okay, I'll bring it back to the board for action. So moved. Second. Oh, I'm sorry, <coughs> Director Cabot, please. 
What's the rodent uh, control machine look like? What are <laughs> it's, it's a device that's towed on a trailer um, that purges the rodent burrows with gas and s to prevent rodents from chewing through our levees, essentially. Yeah, all the tunneling and the little yeah. holes that they uh, Yes. Uh, okay. <coughs> So we have a motion from Director Vilsic and a second from Director Leopold. All those in favor? Uh, aye. aye. Opposed? All right, it passes unanimously. Moving on to item <coughs> seven is the Board of Directors Zone 7 to accept and file status on the Shell Road pump station as recommended by the district engineer. We also do have Pajaro Lagoon historic aerials in the attachment. Mr. Strudley. Thank you, <coughs> Director, uh, Chair Friend. Um, with your and the board's permission, I'd like to invite um, Rusty to the dais to uh, present this item. Welcome, please. Good morning, here. Uh, good morning, members of the board. My name is Rusty Barker. I'm the civil engineer for uh, Flood Control Zone 7. I'm returning to the board to report on the status of Shell Road Pump Station pump system. Um, since the last board, e board meeting, I've reviewed historic documentation, the pump station performance, uh, maintenance and utility costs, and looked in some of the hydraulic modeling that's been done and feasibility of that. Uh, my findings showed that the pump station is pr currently performing adequately. Annual average costs, which include utilities, labor, maintenance, repairs, is roughly uh, $25,000 per year. Um, looked into the modeling, and there's been some modeling by Pajaro Valley Water Management Agency of the lagoon system, and I think they're currently looking at the, the lagoon or the lower lagoon um, right now, but the main findings, I, f I found that the pump station and the pump system's primary function is for water quality and less for flood control. Um, the system helps to inhibit intrusion of salt water into the upper slough while keeping water levels low in the slough to help promote drainage. And then the main finding was sea level rise will likely impact the effectiveness of the pump station's performance. Um, it's estimated that we can see six to 10 feet of sea level rise by the year 2100. Uh, the plan moving forward is to develop a scope, a uh, scope of work to investigate the impacts of sea level rise. Some of the questions we're looking to answer are how much will sea level rise impact uh, the pump system? When might we expect it to become completely ineffective? Um, are pump station improvements pragmatic? Doing a facilities assessment does the pump station need to be redesigned, uh, relocated, removed? And then looking into cost sharing opportunities with the Army Corps um, through the continuing authorities program. Um, that concludes my presentation. I ask that this be accepted and filed um, as recommended by the district engineer. Thank you, are there any questions? Yeah. Director Caput. Yeah, thanks, uh, thanks for uh, addressing this problem. Uh, money has been collected uh, over the years uh, for uh, maintaining that pump, right? Mm -hmm. So are we, we're actually gonna replace it now or we're, or we're gonna, you were talking about the improvements there. So, so money is is collected through district uh, district fees, but that money is applied towards maintenance and operation of the facility. Um, we did have a line item in the this year's approved budget to examine potential improvements or replacement to the facility, since it was mentioned as a capital improvements project in the formation documents of Zone Seven. Um, and Rusty has been working hard over the last several months looking at what, what is the best recommendation to make in terms of potentially rehabilitating that facility. And his recommendation at this point is that we need to do some more analysis and look into uh, what the condition of the facility is through some expert uh, engineering eyes that we might hire out and also to look at um, the lifespan of this facility related to sea level rise as well as its its condition itself to see what the best recommendation was would be to either replace it, abandon it at some point, uh, seek investment um, for rehabilit rehabilitation through either the Army Corps or um, somewhere else. So we're still uh, in the 
exploratory phase, shall we say. Sure. Now, uh, <coughs> how much money has been collected over the years for this project? <coughs> So it's, it's difficult to answer that question because there has been a, a line item for Shell Road pump reconstruction in our budget, but um, it was well before my time here with the district sure. when that line item actually had an allocation to it. So we brought in an allocation this last year to answer some of these questions. So I can't tell you that there was money specifically set aside for Shell Road pumps, but it was mentioned in the capital improvement uh, projects list for the formation of zone seven. So it's been on the minds of some for, for quite some time. Right, and uh, that's what I'm getting at is where that money is. And <coughs> uh, you mentioned there's a possibility we could uh, abandon the pump. Well, 100 years down the road, if we do indeed have six to 10 feet of sea level rise, that pump will most assuredly be um, quite ineffective at doing anything other than sitting there in the ground. So the question, one of the questions we have is at what point does sea level rise make this facility obsolete? And we don't know the answer to that question right now. Okay, so we're, we're looking at it now. Uh, when would we have an answer on what we're going to do with it? So we would either, if we're required to go to the board for a large enough uh, consultant contract, we would bring that to your attention at one of our upcoming board meetings, or if the contract is small enough, we'll go off and seek that consultant expertise on our own and try to answer those questions, and we're happy to report back to the board on, on our findings and that consultant's work. Well, uh, with uh, let's say time goes by and it would be up to one of us to ask for another report on this. Or it, will we have some kind of a report on it uh, six months from now? I can't guarantee a report six months from now, but we can continue to update the board on, on the progress and the findings that we do get as we go through this process. Okay. I'll just ask that we ask for an update in uh, maybe uh, June when we're doing the, uh, when we have a zone seven meeting during the budget hearings. Okay, okay. I'll, I'll ask that that we have an update in uh, okay. June. Okay. Uh, is there anybody from the committee who'd like to address this on this item? All right, so we'll bring it back to the board. Uh, it would be a motion for the recommended action with a additional direction for an update uh, during the budget hearing on this item. So approved. So, so moved. So moved. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> we have a motion from Director Bill Sitch and a second from Director Leopold. Thanks for the additional direction, Director Caput. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? It passes unanimously. Moving on to item eight is the Board of Directors of Zone 7 to accept and file status update Pajaro River Flood Risk Reduction Project as were recommended by the District Engineer. We also have the Pajaro DC meetings agenda and the U.S. ACE visit to Pajaro agenda. Mr. Strudley. Thank you, Chair Friend. Uh, Board of Directors, just um, here to provide another update to you on the Pajaro River Flood Risk Reduction Project with the Army Corps. Um, there has uh, been a lot uh, that's gone on since we last spoke about this project. Um, as I said to you during the uh, uh, board item for award of contract to PBI, we are expecting completion of the feasibility phase in March, and that will include the feasibility report and the director's report. Um, and we will have to wait until the federal government gets around to passing their next Army Corps budget next federal fiscal year to um, ask the Corps to provide work plan funds from fiscal year 2020. They will be going through that process um, development in February and March, right around the time that we get our report. So we're continuing to work very closely with the Corps to make sure that they are including us in their request that's gonna be going up to headquarters um, for the budgetary process next year. Um, we had hoped to bring um, some progress to your attention on our plans to embark on CEQA for the project, but because of the lapse in federal funding as well as some of the hiccups with the hydrology and hydraulic analysis, we weren't able to move quite as quickly on that front as we had hoped, and so it's been somewhat difficult to develop um, an appropriate scope of work with Cardno, who you authorized to award contract to for the CEQA analysis at our September board meeting. Um, we are having a call with them later this month, um, and uh, the work that Peterson Brewstad will be doing for us initially on the hydraulics 
um, corrections to some of the core's work will help us in, in, in that way um, in, in uh, completing CEQA. Um, so we, uh, we went on a visit in October to Washington, D.C., um, and we visited with uh, a number of entities there and had representation both from Zone 7, from Monterey County Water Resources, the city of Watsonville. Um, and we had a fairly successful visit. One of the notable visits that we had was with Senator Feinstein herself. Um, and so along with her support as well as Senator Harris, we're hoping that they can assist with us in our relationship with the Corps in getting this project built. Um, we continue to have great success and partnership with Congressman Panetta as well. Um, and we were able to meet with Zoe Lofgren's staff, um, Congresswoman Zoe Lofgren um, from Santa Clara area. And because of the fact that the Pajaro River and the Pajaro River system reaches up into her neck of the woods. And so we made her aware of our project and interest and she is supportive as well. Um, we also had a visit from uh, top brass of the Corps on December 6th. So Brigadier General Kim Colleton, who is the head uh, military officer at the Army Corps Division Office in San Francisco, as well as Lieutenant Colonel Travis Rayfield uh, from the San Francisco District, uh, visited us along with their new Deputy District Engineer, Stu Townsley. So Stu Townsley is someone I've known for a while. Uh, he's definitely more helpful than some of the core personnel we've in, been involved with in the past, and so I hope that will pay us some dividends. Um, we were able to show them around the Pajaro Valley to important spots, make them aware of how important this project is, and uh, I'm continuing to discuss the project uh, with Stu um, on quite a regular basis since he stepped in, and so I'm really hopeful that he's going to help us um, build a successful project here. Um, we continue to work closely with our, our friends at the State of California Department of Water Resources and their subventions program. We still are authorized uh, under that program to receive funding, but that funding hinges on federal investment. Um, so we are still continuing to work with them in arranging that, that investment from the state. Um, and Mark Stone uh, continues to assist us in our relationship with the state and our subventions authorization. Um, I'm happy to uh, answer any questions you have about the nuances of this project and developments, and uh, the recommended action here is to accept and file the status report on the project. Thank you. Any questions, Director Bilsich? Not a question, more of a statement. And I just want to say how much I appreciate what you're doing, Mark, because we know whether this project goes or doesn't go is all political. And um, we, we've talked and talked and talked about it for years, but it's great to see um, under the uh, leadership of Chairman Friend and um, you and, and others w in, the, in the department have made some significant progress. I mean, we actually saw boulders being put on this, you know, repairs being made on the South Suedes Creek. That wouldn't have happened, I don't think, 10, 15 years ago. It's like now people understand we have a problem and it's whether it happens or doesn't is political. So Congressman Panetta, Senator Feinstein, whoever we can get involved and realizes that little Watsonville, um, Pajaro needs our help, um, thank you for all you're doing. Appreciate it. No, thank you and, and thanks to all the support coming from, from the board and elsewhere to make this project happen. Thank you. Any other questions, Director Caput? You bet. Yeah, I want to thank you also, and uh, we're we're <coughs> we're coming up on a critical phase, right, uh, in March. But is the government shutdown going to end up delaying this, or is there going to be some <coughs> possible diversion of money uh, that would go uh, to be taken out of the uh, Army Corps' hands and put into maybe something else? Like, uh, well, i.e., a wall. <laughs> okay. I was wondering if that was going to come up today. Um, so the core budget was passed in late September. So they are unaffected by the shutdown. So they're continuing to work through finishing the report, responding to the comments that they've received from headquarters. So we still expect to get our report in March. Um, the, 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 the banter about um, core funding being uh, taken away and applied to something like the wall is not affecting our project directly. Um, that is 
the, that is being uh, discussed as it might affect other projects that are authorized to be designed and built. And are, we're not at that stage yet. You bet. Um, and uh, real, uh, I'll uh, make a, a comment or question on uh, the South Sapotes uh, uh, Creek, uh, putting the boulders, building up the uh, dam walls and, uh, and all that. Uh, who was the final paper we had to do on that? I, th I think it's great that it's done, but we had to have an approval and we were able to do it. it was that uh, Fish and Game, Fish and Wildlife? So, so we, that was a core project and a core responsibility. So they were, because it was their responsibility, they were the ones that coordinated all the necessary permits from the resource agencies. Yeah, and uh, what, what changed them? Uh, before they used to be always the stumbling block on that. What, I, what I'm impressed by is the fact that they actually seem to be pushing it. it are, are you still with speaking you, of your, the repair projects? Help, of course, uh, you know. Um, they were very cooperative is what I'm getting at. For years, they wouldn't touch anything almost, except for the bench excavation. Uh, I can't speak to maybe some of that historical perspective, but um, we, we did have to poke and prod them quite a bit to get them to repair those, those sites, and they did it a year after we had hoped. We wanted to get them to button up those sites before the next winter, and of course it was, it was one summer after that that they actually succeeded in, in repairing those, but um, we had help from, uh, from, from the board, from letters from the board to the Army Corps. We had help from Congressman Panetta, and we had a lot of activity at the staff level to try to poke and prod them and make that happen, and it, it succeeded. Yeah, no, that's good. Uh, what was the final cost? Uh, to the district, zero. Um, the project costs to the core for those repairs were somewhere in the vicinity of six and a half million dollars. Six and a half, okay, thank you very much. Good work. Anybody from the community would like to address this on this item? Okay, we'll bring it back to the board. It's a status update, but it's there's an accept and file action. Still moved. Second. Second. We have a motion from Director <laughs> Leopold and a second from Director Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? It passes unanimously. We move on to item nine, which is the Board of Directors of Zone 7 to consider adoption of a resolution amending the Zone 7 rules and regulations related to regular meetings, agenda materials, and order of business and take related actions as outlined in the memo of the district engineer. We have the resolution amending rules and regs for Zone 7 and the previous <coughs> agenda materials. Uh, Mr. Strudley, thank you for bringing this item forward after we discussed it at previous meetings. Thank you, Chair Friend board. Uh, this is an administrative matter that will hopefully make things more efficient for our, our operations here. Um, notably, the changes that we are recommending is to include additional wording to clarify that uh, in the rules and regulations that ensures the coordination of the board uh, with the board of supervisors meeting schedule um, so that we don't uh, run into a pitfall with scheduling a board of directors meeting uh, with the board of supervisors meeting um, conflicting. Um, we wish to uh, have agenda materials to be distributed w in conjunction with the Ralph M. Brown Act, uh, require agenda and related material be posted and distributed no later than 72 hours prior to the meeting. Um, we would like to uh, have a con both a consent and regular agenda um, and include a program manager's report in that agenda. Um, and. We would like to reorder the agenda configuration, moving oral communications to the third item of the agenda, and to conduct the order of business as indicated in the board item, beginning with roll call and going through uh, the items listed there, including the program manager's report, um, which at uh, Director Bilicic's request includes a, power, a standing item for Power River status update. Um, no cost, obviously, so our recommendation is to consider changes to this Zone 7 rules and regulations related to regular meetings, agenda materials, and order of business, and to adopt resolution amending resolution number 2-Z7, approving said amendments. Any questions from board members before we open it up? No questions. Anybody from the community? All right, we'll bring it back for action. So moved. Second. We have a motion from Director Bilicic and a second from Director Coonerty. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That passes unanimously. And the final item of business is the Board of Directors of Zone 7. 
is to approve the 2019 Zone 7 Board of Directors meeting schedule as outlined in the memo of District Engineer, Mr. Strudley, on this item. Thank you, Chair Friend. Another administrative item uh, confirming the meeting schedule listed there, including today's meeting as well as March 26th, 1045 a.m. in Santa Cruz. June 17th, 7 p.m. budget hearing in Watsonville and a September 17th, 7 p.m. meeting in Watsonville as well. So the recommended action is to approve the 2019 Zone 7 Board of Directors meeting schedule. The Director Caput? No, no. I'll, I'll make a motion to approve, but if there's any public comment first. Any questions? Okay, anybody from the community on the schedule? All right, bring it back, Director Caput. I'll, I'll motion to uh, approve. Uh, motion from Director Caput. Good job there, Director McPherson, getting on the record there. <laughs> a second for Director McPherson. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? <laughs> it passes unanimously. That'll end the Zone 7 meeting. Thank you, uh, uh, Mark, for all of your work on the, these issues. I'll turn it back to the Chair of Board of Supervisors. Thank you, and we will. Thank you, and we will resume our meeting uh, for our final item of the day. And thank you to everyone who's been waiting patiently. Uh, for it to be called up. This is item number 11, which is to consider a report and presentation of the Advisory Task Force on Justice and Gender, adopt a resolution supporting the Bill of Rights uh, for children of incarcerated parents, and take related, related actions recommended by the task force as outlined in the memorandum of the S S County CAO. And we have Nicole Coburn. Good uh, morning, here to present this item. Can you? So in April of 2017, Dr. Susan Green presented a report to the board that was supported by the Sheriff's Office entitled The Gender Matters, A Profile of Women in Santa Cruz County Jail. It was based on 31 interviews with women in the main jail in Blaine Street. In response to the report, the board convened the Advisory Task Force on Justice and Gender for a 24-month term. Um, representatives from Health and Justice leaders from county agencies, community-based organizations, and the community were appointed to the task force. The task force began meeting in December 2017 and is facilitated by Dr. Susan Green. Dr. Green has over 20 years experience in the criminal justice system. She has conducted and published a number of studies on women in jail with a focus on their social histories, risk fast risk factors that contribute to their incarceration and what women face upon release from jail. She was also the founding director of the GEMMA program and is currently a research associate in the psychology department at UCSC. Today, Dr. Green and members of the task force will be here to present recommendations in three areas. The first, reducing harm to children of incarcerated parents. The second, housing for women. And lastly, preventing and responding to sexual abuse in jails. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Green. Good morning, members of the board, and thank you for convening this advisory task force on justice and gender. I wanna start by asking task force representatives to please stand and be recognized for your full commitment and participation in this effort to address and identify the unique needs of women cycling through our local criminal justice system. It's truly an honor to work alongside these health and justice leaders in our community. And I also want to extend thanks to our Assistant County Administrative Officer, Nicole Coburn, and Senior Administrative Analyst, Sven Stafford, for your guidance and support. And to Supervisor John Leopold for serving as the board's representative and showing up regularly. And to my UCSC research assistants for your dedication and lots of research behind the scenes. And I would like to again acknowledge the Sheriff's Office for supporting the Gender Matters research with women in jail that laid the foundation for this task force. Finally, I want to thank the Fairfield Inn and Suites on 41st Avenue where they generously hosted our meetings in their beautiful conference space because they too support our mission. We've had 10 meetings to date and we're here today to present recommendations in the three areas that Nicole just identified. Thank you. Of the 31 women who participated in the Gender Matters study, nearly three out of four are mothers, and more than half had a parent who was also incarcerated. 
It is these cycles of intergenerational incarceration that guide the work of our task force. We've talked a lot about childhood trauma with a focus on prevention and intervention. Intervention to help women heal and reduce recidivism, and prevention, supporting healthy families so that their children do not continue to suffer similar cycles of trauma and pain and incarceration. We try to be trauma-informed in our own meetings too, and to that end, I want to acknowledge that some of what we'll hear today is painful, but it is important that we talk about these issues to instigate positive change. And I encourage people for whom some of these issues may be triggering to please reach out for support as needed. Generally, discussions about criminal justice reform focus on individuals and less often consider their children or their roles and responsibilities as parents. I want to invite you for a moment to think of a person in your childhood who mothered you, maybe your biological mother, maybe somebody else, and think about that relationship. Our primary caregivers have significant influence on our development during at least the first decade of our lives and often for years following. Those relationships, often complicated, are central to human development. I think we can agree that there's no question about the importance of the first years of life. And I know this board supports several related initiatives, including Thrive by Three, First Five, Nursing Family Partnership, and Cradle to Career. As the task force considers issues from the perspective of women and the effects on their children and families, we are committed to including people with lived experience in the criminal justice system. And there are several identified representatives on the task force who bring experiences to life and are also models of resilience, healing, and transformation. They are not just there to share their stories, they are experts and help strategize organize and lead in efforts to help reform our criminal justice system to do less harm to individuals and their families. It is my honor to introduce to you one of those leaders, Chad Platt, who's going to speak about his experiences related to our first recommendation, reducing harm to children of incarcerated parents. Chad is a youth advocate who's a model of resilience, strength, and power, and a true leader dedicated to positive changes for youth and our communities. Thank you, Susan, and thank the board for having me here today as well. Um, what I'm sharing with you today happened some time ago. However, with my work in the community as a youth advocate, it's something that I see reoccurring. It's something that we can end. <laughs> And it's something that we can come together as a community with to better serve children of incarcerated parents. I was nine years old when I witnessed my mother being arrested. I had so many questions and it was all a mystery to me. Um, there was a raid at our residence and my mother was taken into cuffs. I was told to take a bag of my belongings and we were separated. Um, I strongly advocated to be able to speak with my mom, just to have some sort of understanding. Um, at nine years old, I was aware that my mom had a substance abuse problem, um, but the fact that there was you know, police at our door and my mom in handcuffs, it was a complete mystery to me. Um, the officers at the time were explaining to me I wasn't able to speak with my mom, and although I was nine years old, um, I wasn't taking no for an answer. So the officers did um, an amazing thing for me. They let me hug my mom in handcuffs, and she explained to me that the people that I would be going with would take care of me. Um, I was moved into a temporary foster care situation. Um, I actually had two separate um, short-term living situations before I was placed um, at a comfortable foster living arrangement. Um, and during this time, not being able to speak to my mother, not being explained what was going on. Um, although I was a child, these were things that I was asking for. These were things that I was ready to hear. Um, and by not explaining and by not telling me, 
it only um, painted a very dark picture in my mind. Um, with the media, with what we see on movies, I was under the impression that, you know, my mom's in the big house and um, not understanding that it's, whether it's Blaine Street Women Jail or Santa Cruz County Jail, it's a lot different than what's put on the media. Um, however, at nine years old, I'm only putting together what I see on TV. Um, during my mom's stay at Blaine Street Women Jail, um, there are several things that would have ultimately made her stay there more comfortable and also had a better um, time for me. Simple things like pictures. Um, I remember being able to visit my mom and um, the difference between playing hangman through the glass at the county jail and not being able to hold her hand, not being able to hug her, versus going into Blaine Street and having that opportunity to touch and feel was amazing. However, being in the foster care system, um, there's no opportunity to take pictures with your parent. And although it's, it's a jail setting, um, it would have been amazing to have some photographs, to have something to look forward to. Um, although this happened when I was nine, it is something that is still happening in our community today. Looking over the Bill of Rights for Children of Incarcerated Parents, it's something that I would love to see adapted. It's something that this community absolutely needs. Um, it's been adopted by the state of California. And uh, with the steps forward that I've seen the community making since I was the nine-year-old that this had happened to, there's been leaps and bounds. And I absolutely appreciate the opportunity to tell my story in hopes to create change and impactful change in this community. Um, to speak more about the Bill of Rights and ways to support children of incarcerated parents, um, I'd like to invite Cynthia Chase up. Thank you. I also want to express my thanks to the chair and the board members for making this issue a priority by hearing from the Justice and Gender Task Force today. Several of us on this task force have been working locally on this issue for decades, and it provides us and those we're advocating for with hope to see the board give its time and attention to hearing from the broad, highly skilled group of subject matter experts, including those with lived experience, who have crafted a series of recommendations for your consideration. We believe these recommendations will improve the lives not just of justice-involved women, but also their families and the community at large. One of the many things the Justice and Gender Task Force has addressed is how we can reduce the collateral damage that is caused at as many decision points as possible when a woman is engaged in the justice system. Generally, the justice system is viewed as a necessary interruption to harmful behaviors that are occurring in the community with the intention of addressing and preventing those behaviors from occurring again. However, what we also need to recognize are the decades of research that shows that these interruptions don't just affect the life of the individual, but because most women are the primary caregivers for their children, these children's lives are also interrupted, sometimes in highly traumatic and damaging ways, as Chad outlined in his own personal experience. Their family, home, school, health and well-being may be impacted, and often decisions are made for them without them. What data has also shown us is that incarceration is intergenerational. Children who experience a parent or primary caregiver's incarceration are much more likely to experience the same life path. The way to break that cycle is by responding differently to circumstances that we know can be harmful but are preventable. A key way to recognize, protect, and provide better outcomes for the children of women who are justice system involved is by following the lead of the California legislature who adopted the Children of Incarcerated Parents Bill of Rights in 2009. 
Therefore, the Justice and Gender Task Force requests that the Board of Supervisors adopt a resolution supporting the Bill of Rights for Children of Incarcerated Parents and direct the Human Services Department, Health Services Agency, Probation Department, and Sheriff's Office to identify opportunities and partners for implementation and to report back to the Board during budget hearings in June 2019. We very much appreciate the opportunity to come and speak to you today to present these recommendations and it is now um, my duty to turn over the next port part of our presentation to Probation Division Director of Adult Services, Sarah Fletcher. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Sarah Fletcher, and in addition to working for the Probation Department as the Adult Division Director, I'm also a community member. I want to start by saying that it has been a privilege to participate in this task force, and I truly appreciate the board's efforts in supporting the group's formation. I'm here this morning to briefly talk about how reducing harm to children at the time of arrest is a prevention effort to reduce psychological trauma that often contributes to intergenerational cycles of pain and incarceration. As you can see from the image up on your screen, memories endure. Kids who witness their parents' arrest event may be traumatized by the sounds and images for years. The experience may lead to nightmares, separation anxiety, aggressive behavior, withdrawal, trouble concentrating in school, or a variety of other mental and physical problems. A well-coordinated response by the agencies involved at the time of arrest to make sure a child is safe and informed can make a difference. This helps to support the relationship between children and their parents, which enhances a child's healthy development. And finally, negative experiences can color future interactions with authority. Children's images of police developed during these encounters can have lasting effects on their views of law enforcement and their future willingness to cooperate with police and abide by the law. The International Association of Chiefs of Police has identified an on-scene checklist for law enforcement to safeguard children of arrested parents. It is understood that many officers already use a number of these strategies and that there are situations where it's not possible or safe for arresting officers to put these into practice. Police officers can make a powerful protect, be a powerful protective factor that decreases the potential harmful effects of parental arrest on children. In October, we invited Chad and Susan to attend the monthly commander's meeting to introduce these efforts and provide an opportunity for our partners to hear a portion of Chad's story, as you had the opportunity a few moments ago. Most local law enforcement agencies have written policies on this subject, but many do not provide ongoing training or implement data collection in this particular area. The task force representatives are now working with several agencies to schedule trainings and include presenters who as children experienced the arrest of a parent. With several of our agencies being both members of the task force and regular attendees of the commanders and chiefs meetings, we are committed to using these roles to keep the dialogue ongoing. I'll conclude with our task force's second recommendation, which is to request that the board chair write a letter to the mayor of each city the Santa Cruz County Law Enforcement Chiefs Association and the California Highway Patrol highlighting the importance of each law enforcement agency having a regular training on reducing harm to children who are present at the time of arrest, along with data collection and annual reporting. Thank you for your time, and I will now hand it over to Patty Quillen, a community representative on our task force. Good morning. Women are the fastest growing segment of America's jail population. Nationally, their numbers have increased 14 fold from 1970 to 2014. And in California, the women's jail population increased almost seven fold from 1,725 in 1970 to 12,054 in 2014. Close to 80% of women in jails are mothers of children under 18 years old, and many of them are single mothers. The 2017 Gender Matters study by Dr. Susan Green found that here in Santa Cruz County jails, nearly three out of four women were mothers, and out of all the mothers in her study, only one in five received a visit from her child while in custody. Relationships between children and parents are the foundation upon which children learn how to trust and depend on others. As we heard from Chad, when a child loses a parent to incarceration, it can be traumatic. When the parent-child bond is interrupted, it can have long-term effects leading to issues like 
antisocial behavior, poor school performance, physical and mental health problems. Due to these issues, children with an incarcerated parent are also at increased risk for criminal behavior, contributing to the cycle of intergenerational incarceration. There are some children for whom it would not be in their best interest to have contact with their parent for a number of reasons, but when family visits are appropriate, studies show that they can help maintain the familial connections, mitigate some of the trauma of separation for both the parent and the child, and reduce recidivism. Parent-child visits are consistent with one of the central tenets of the Children of Incarcerated Parents Bill of Rights, specifically that children have the right to speak with, see, and touch their parents. A growing body of research supports the use of contact visits which allow children to see that their parents are safe and healthy while in jail and can help reduce the children's feelings of abandonment and anxiety. Physical contact and privacy during visits can benefit both parents and children, helping them reconnect with each other. Many experts believe that contact visits conducted in supportive, safe, and child-friendly environments are the best option to help families reduce the harmful effects of parental incarceration. Research indicates that visits are most beneficial when they are part of a family strengthening program and provide proper emotional preparation beforehand as well as debriefing afterwards. And now I'll just read the, uh, the task force um, request. The task force requests that the board ask representatives from Family and Children's Services, court-appointed special advocates, the sheriff's office, and the task force to consider the value of visits for children of incarcerated parents and to fil facilitate more opportunities for communication and visits between children and their parents who are in local jails. The need to understand barriers to visitation by speaking with mothers in jail has been identified as one of the first steps. Thank you. The next area, <clears throat> topic area, is related to housing. And although housing was not a specific meeting topic that we focused on to date, concerns about the lack of safe housing and the high rates of homelessness among women in and out of jail came up consistently. Task force representatives reiterated the reality that the lack of safe housing for women is the biggest barrier to safety, both for individuals and the community, and often leads to further trauma, relapse, and reincarceration. Women are not only the fastest growing population of people in our jails and prisons, but are also the fastest growing population of people who are homeless. I'd like to introduce Nicole Cadle, one of our local leaders and task force representative. I'd like to start by saying thank you to Susan for this opportunity and John and Nicole as well for all of your help on this committee. In the roughly 11 years I've lived in Santa Cruz County, housing has never been anything that came easy for me. Prior to my own personal involvement in the criminal justice system, even as a doughy-eyed college student, I was taken advantage of trying to secure accommodations for myself. Fast forward to 2013, and I'm completing my jail sentence at Blaine Street and asking, but where do I go from here? I don't have money. I don't have contact with my family yet, and all of my friends are either addicts or criminals. I was scared to leave jail. In jail, I was able to get clean. I was able to eat and have a warm place to sleep every day, and the people around me didn't cast, cast harsh judgments based on my current reality. I was lucky, and I know that may sound confusing, because who in jail is lucky? But I was. I was offered the opportunity to go to the Gemma House, the one and only all-female, no initial cost program for formerly incarcerated women in Santa Cruz County. Little known fact, did you know that the last time the county invested a large amount in a property for that kind of housing was in 2007 for the Gemma House? And it hasn't happened since. I was grateful for my time at Gemma but with little skills and an attitude that none of my clinical team could rein in, I was discharged from the Gemma House in late November of 2013. I had nowhere to go. An old boyfriend offered me to stay at his house for a few days, but that wasn't a safe situation. Sadly, I had no other options. 
After a few terrible days and trying my hardest not to use drugs, I ended up moving to Southern California and leaving behind all of my support systems. There were no options for me in Santa Cruz. I didn't have the money to get into another program. I didn't qualify for AB 109, and I didn't have kids, so none of those special circumstance funds were available to me. I was lost, and I found myself in a place I did not want to be, with people who did not understand me at that time. I wanted to use to quiet the uncomfortable feelings of wanting to do better for myself, but having every door of opportunity shut in my face because I wasn't financially, financially capable of paying for my recovery. Again, I will state that I was lucky. I had a grandma who was capable and able to rescue me and could support my placement in an all-female sober living environment run by Sobriety Works. I was lucky because I made it into one of only five programs here in Santa Cruz for women. Janice and Encompass both also have options for women, but the bed space is limited and the wait lists are long. There isn't enough capacity to meet the need, ever. I've lived and managed a 12-bed female sober living environment for three years. It was a great opportunity for me and truly saved my life. Not everyone gets that opportunity, though. Not everybody who has a grandma who can front the cost to get into safe housing. Sadly, the story of women who have to go back to unsafe situations, abusive relationships, or homelessness is way more common than my story of success. Countless times living in the sober living environment, I heard stories about women who lost their children to the CPS system because they were unable to secure housing in a timely manner. Or women who were able to receive AB 109 funding, PACT funding, or another great funding opportunity, but then lost that and what comes next? Self-sufficient living in Santa Cruz County? I think not. Even working full-time in Santa Cruz here today, I can't afford my own housing due to the high cost of living and wages, and yet we expect these women to just put their lives together, stop using drugs, get a job, get housing, take care of their kids, and become happy, content members of our community. In Dr. Green's Gender Matters report, 75% of the women in Santa Cruz County Jail's interviewed stated that they had experienced homelessness, and 50% of them stated that they had nowhere to go after their release. It's a terrible feeling knowing that you are doing everything you can to work on yourself, heal from trauma, focus on recovery, and at the end of all of that, your only options are to go back to the streets that led you to jail in the first place or another trauma-inducing environment. The obstacles stacked in front of women as they exit incarceration are hard to dodge, even for those of us who fall under the lucky category. Even I was discharged from a program with little hope for what was coming next. For the women who end up on the streets, back in traumatic or abusive relationships and situations, or left alone after every door they've knocked on has been shut in their face, the feelings of hopelessness create a pool so deep that you can drown in. I say it's time we stop shutting doors in the face of women and create more opportunities and pathways for success in this county. That opportunity can start with you. Take a chance like the Board of Supervisors did in 2007. That chance, that choice, saved my life. What choices, what chances can you take today to save the lives of many others? Thank you. Our final recommendation is related to preventing and responding to sexual abuse in custody. The Me Too movement has helped more people understand how vast and pervasive sexual assault and sexual harassment really is. Sexual violence against women is about power relationships, deeply rooted in the subordination of women to men, and pervades virtually all cultures, races, and classes. Incarcerated women report disproportionately high rates of sexual abuse, rape, and domestic violence, 
and are in an environment where they are under the control of mostly men with power over them, where they cannot escape their abusers, and where they often fear retaliation if they speak up. Next, I'd like to introduce Cassie Gazapura, a representative from the Public Defender's Office. Good morning. Good morning. Tens of thousands of women experience sexual violence in custody each year, with more than half perpetrated by jail or prison staff. Sexual abuse in jails and prisons is a systemic, nationwide crisis that has generally received less attention than sexual abuse outside of custodial settings. This crisis led to the U.S. Department of Justice's issuance of national standards called the Prison Rape El Elimination Act, or PREA, which requires detention facilities to give those in custody multiple ways to report sexual abuse and mandates that every allegation is investigated. Correctional staff does now receive PREA training, but abuse is still prevalent, and women in custody are often reluctant to report sexual abuse for fear of retaliation. In response to the arrest of Correctional Officer Marco Del Real for unlawful sexual contact with a woman in custody at the county jail, Sheriff Jim Hart convened a serious incident review board to examine the reporting and response systems in the jails and make recommendations for improvements. The task force applauds Sheriff Hart's actions and commitment to eradicate this abusive behavior. The recommendations that came out of this review board were presented by the Sheriff's Office to the task force last fall. Overall, task force representatives were encouraged by the recommendations and the progress reportedly already moving several of them forward. As a group, we also expressed concerns specifically around the recommendation to designate a sheriff's detective to investigate all allegations of sexual abuse in the jails. The task force has ongoing concerns about the optics and trustworthiness of hiring an internal detective who is employed by the same agency they are hired to investigate, and we recommend a contract with an external investigator for that reason. We believe it is in the best interest of the Sheriff's Office to use an external investigator, and other government agencies have data that supports this practice. The U.S. Department of Agriculture, for example, recently released a report on the U.S. Forest Service's process of handling complaints of sexual harassment, stating that there were many problems with their own internal investigations. They ultimately concluded that the practice of using internal investigators may have deepened the mistrust in the system, and the report recommended switching to a process of independent contract investigators to look into these types of claims for the purpose of creating more trust in the system overall. The second reason we recommend an external investigator is to ensure that women feel safe in coming forward, particularly when we know the statistics around underreporting. According to Jesse Lerner Kinglake of Just Detention International, a group that works to end sexual violence in all detention facilities, rates of underreporting are even higher in custody. She says, quote, on top of feelings of shame and the victim blaming that all survivors face, Detainees who are sexually abused by staff are faced with the horrifying prospect of having to report the assault to their rapist colleagues and friends, end quote. The JAG Task Force looks forward to continuing this conversation and working together with the Sheriff's Department to explore different models that use external investigators for claims of sexual assault in custody. Thank you. That concludes our presentation, and I want to thank our speakers again and task force representatives for bringing us to this point today. These recommendations are important steps toward reducing harm to children of incarcerated parents, increasing safety from sexual assault for women in jail and women experiencing homelessness, and improving community health and safety. I want to thank the board again for convening this task force and recognizing the importance of our work. We're not alone in our efforts, as there are thousands of people across the state and nation also working to strengthen families directly impacted by the criminal justice system and to do less harm. I came to graduate school here at UCSC interested in working with children of incarcerated parents as a point of prevention and quickly learned that they are often an invisible group and the best way to help them was to help their mothers. Here it is 25 years later and I'm working with some of these children of incarcerated parents as adults. Working in partnership with these local leaders on the task force, 
I'm as motivated as ever to continue. And I continue to feel that the more I learn, the harder it is to walk away and pretend it's not my problem. Thank you for joining us in this important effort. We're happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. On behalf of the board, on behalf of the community and women experiencing incarceration and their families, I wanna thank all of you uh, for your really amazing work. It helps to not only have the solid research and the best practices, but then also the input from lived experience so we can get a real sense of how we can bend these systems uh, or change these systems to get better outcomes for everybody involved. It's now uh, an opportunity for questions. Supervisor Caput. You bet. Uh, yeah, I wanna thank the uh, task force for everything you've done. Uh, I remember this came up about, what, two years ago? Was that about right? A year ago. Yeah, a little, a little over a year, okay. And uh, you've done a remarkable job. Uh, I remember on the list uh, when we, they were talking about different problems <coughs> uh, in the uh, women's part of the jail. And sometimes some of the easiest things were very, uh, you know, to fix, were very irritating to some. And I, I'm just curious on, there were uh, two on the list that should have been able to be solved very quickly and easily. One was if you make a phone call, you're allowed so many phone calls or whatever, and if you called home and the children weren't home, you weren't allowed to call back. Has that, has that been uh, rectified? Uh, let, let's say the mother is in the jail, she calls home, but her kids happen to be somewhere. Are they able to call back again or have they lost their phone call? I think that, I, I'm not sure that this specifically came up with re relation. I think phone calls are made, um, there's a whole procedure and they have to be made collect from the jail. So. I right. don't know if you have, so anybody who's in custody makes collect phone calls. So if somebody on the other end is able to accept it and they're able to speak with their children in their home, otherwise they have to call back later. Okay, and they're allowed how many, what, one phone call? I think there's, I, I don't think it's a number of phone calls. They, they have, all phone calls made by people in custody have to be collect calls to the person they're calling. So the person they're calling pays for the cost of the call. Right, even if it's a local call. Yes. Okay. And then the other would be uh, the television. Uh, is, is that, that should have been solved a long time ago, but anyway. Yes, so I, I had a feeling you might ask about this. Yes, we have solved the television issue. It is much more complicated than one might think to just have television in a jail, uh, but the issue has been addressed. And it's not necessarily on the same channel as the one in the men's. Correct. That's right. And that's Good. particularly an issue right now when football's on, because the women really don't want to watch that. <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, uh, yeah, uh, you, you remember that movie uh, by Ken Kesey, uh, One Flew Over the whatever, and uh, one of the biggest things in that movie was about the television during a sports program and whether or not somebody wanted to watch this or that. So those, those small things, if you can't fix the small things, it makes people wonder if you can fix the bigger problems. Yeah. So I wanna thank you for that. Of course, thank you. Supervisor McPherson. Yeah, I want to thank the task force and Dr. Green for, for bringing this to us, and I'm very pleased to be able to support your recommendations, uh, especially those that are designed um, for, to reduce the harm to children and all. And um, to appreciate the rec, I also appreciate the recommendation on housing, which is a tremendous problem overall here. But, uh, you know, it's going to be interesting. I think we're going to get some reports back during budget session on several of these. Um, the state, uh, this county, has tried to address housing issues overall, but I think we, this, reminds us and directs us to pay some special attention to this, uh, to these uh, formerly incarcerated women and their, their families. So I do appreciate that. It's a huge problem or 
a huge issue that we need to confront and we're going to do the best we can to do that. Um, and I think it's uh, legitimate to say that this, uh, you know, the, those who have been, women who have been incarcerated and those especially with children should get some special attention in this regard. So I hope we can do what we can. I, I might ask, um, I don't know who would be the right person to ask if there have been any recent housing relation issues, which is a huge issue throughout the state that the state has implemented that I might not be aware of, of addressing this issue specifically. I'm not sure that that's the case, but uh, I surely think we should look into it to see if there are any recent pieces of legislation, uh, grant program uh, prospects and so forth, and how we can specifically address this population. So if, uh, I don't know if anybody has that answer now, but I would like to have that be part of the report back, and maybe it was going to be, but uh, I'd like to see if uh, there's anything recently that has come up that we should pay special attention to to address this issue. Thank you. So now we're gonna hear from uh, members of the public. I'd ask if you're interested in speaking today uh, to please line up if you're able and uh, we'd love to hear your comments. Good afternoon, I am Lynn Petrovic, the Executive Director of the Court Appointed Special Advocates of Santa Cruz County. Good morning, Supervisors. My name is Jimmy Cook. I am the Program Director at CASA of Santa Cruz and also a member of the gender, uh, Justice and Gender Task Force. We are both uh, social workers and together we have about 50 years of experience working with traumatized and abused and neglected children. So we thought uh, we would come forward today uh, one, because it's our job to advocate for traumatized children, but also to offer our support for the task force findings, the three recommendations, specifically the adoption of the Bill of Rights of Children of Incarcerated Parents, the, that action be taken to reduce the harm experienced by children who are present when their parents are arrested, and that steps be taken to facilitate contact between children and their mothers who are incarcerated. We'd like to address the last concern, contact between uh, children and their mothers who are incarcerated. Uh, as a former social worker here in Santa Cruz County in child welfare, I know firsthand that separation from a caregiver, from a parent, especially a birth parent, is, is traumatizing for a child. Um, we've seen young children so stressed after their parent is arrested, they don't even play, they might not eat, they might not sleep, they have nightmares. Um, they can at times just sit motionless with no expression at all on their face. To say the least, these children are not <clears throat> at all in a position to thrive. And we also know that palpable relief that they experience as soon as they have that first contact with their parents, even if it's by a phone call. Unfortunately, what we know is oftentimes mothers who are in prison or in jail don't know where their children are and they can't reach their children. So weeks can go by before this initial contact and those children are left in that state of fear and anxiety and trauma. Over the last couple of decades, there's been a lot of literature um, and research done about supervised contact between children and their parents. It's been established that regular frequent contact is beneficial to the outcomes of these children. For this reason, we believe that contact between mothers who are incarcerated and their children should be frequent and regular <clears throat> unless deemed a detriment by the court to that child. We also know that the environment that this contact is held in is very, very important. The outcomes for those children are much better if it's a, the contact is held in a child-friendly environment. And for that reason, we're asking three things. One, that you consider having visitation and contact set up very quickly, that it be regular and frequent when appropriate, and that it be held in a child-friendly environment. In summary, we're very respectful that the board consider these steps um, that the Justice and Gender Task Force has presented before you so that the contact between children and their incarcerated mothers be established very quickly. And, and we thank you for your time. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Hello, my name is Mary, and um, I would like to address the, ch um, the children thing. Um, I have been state raised. I have been in prison most of my life. Um, 
I also have two children that have been affected by my stay in prison and in jail. Um, I have a son that's 15 years old and I was pregnant through um, my whole incarceration. So um, he, and when I was let out, I was using drugs. So my son was drug exposed and I was incarcerated back in a way and they both both my children have been infected affected by my incarceration and so they have been we have been separated so now my son is part of mental health and so is my daughter and i have no relationship at all with both of them and so now i am trying to get reunified with them and cp i'm cps involved but cps is not um they don't contact me at all. Like they don't, you know, try to like say, hey, you know, I want to um, try to reunify with you at all. So what I would like to see is because now I'm part of BHU Mental Health, and I would like to see like maybe probation and like the court systems try to help me get involved so that way we can have like maybe like some type of visits or something. Since you guys are talking about this, it's, you know, it's bringing up some feelings, that, you know, around that. So maybe you guys can like, you know, maybe probation or like maybe judge guy with the BHU, you know, like try to like work something out. Um, with that, and then like also with the homelessness thing um, about, what's that? Oh, I got 59 seconds. With the homelessness um, thing, um, I also was affected by that. I was um, doing very good in Blaine Street, and um, I had no resources, um, and uh, got let out and went back on the levy, and without BHU and probation right now, um, I'm doing good and I'm healthy, but without you guys, without probation and stuff, I wouldn't be doing good. But please help the women in the jail system, please. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Good afternoon. I'm Emily Bally, the Deputy Director of the Human Services Department, and I also have the privilege of being um, our department's representative on the Justice and Gender Task Force. I just want to say that this experience has been really great um, for me personally, and to hear from people with lived experiences and their children to help us inform our policies and procedures has been, um, I, I just can't express how invaluable that is to us. Um, I also want to give some thanks to Susan for her dedication and commitment to this effort. And I look forward to our department working with the other county departments and our community partners to move these forward. Thank you. Buenos dias, good morning. Uh, my name is Teresa Carino, and I am on the task force, and I'm also a commissioner for the Santa Cruz County Women's Commission co-founder and director of Salud y Cariño, an after-school program that promotes health and wellness for middle school girls. So as a woman, as a mother, as a community uh, advocate, I strongly urge the County Board of Supervisors to, to listen to these recommendations that we've put before you. I'm honored to work on this task force, <coughs> and I am proud of the recommendations that were presented here today. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shauna Riley, and um, I am grateful I live at Gemma, and thank you to Gemma. And so I'm fortunate enough to have come from jail to a, um, a place where I get to go to school and I don't have to worry about a tent city that's growing, and it scares me because I know what goes on there, and it's domestic violence and drugs and perpetual nightmare. And I wanted to let you know what happens in jail when you don't have a place to go and there's not enough programs for women. You, you, you get, you, morale goes down for women. It, you, you go, I don't have any hope, you know? So they don't think, okay, well, I'm gonna get out of jail and I'm gonna get my kids back and it's gonna be great and I'm gonna strive they just go back to some bad situation 
and then they come right back to jail. So then they, they, they commit an even worse crime. So then when they come back to jail, now they take a prison sentence so they can get AB 109 funding. I don't know if you guys all know that. So now they're committing worse crimes so that they can get AB 109 funding so that they can get into a program. I know it doesn't seem smart, but that's how you can get into a program in this county. So I've been into a lot of other counties where you don't have to take a prison sentence to get a program. You can go to a THU, you can go to a program, you know, like, and, you, and I, it's kind of, to me, a little strange that you have to take a prison sentence to get a program in a county jail. So just kind of take a look at that, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, my name is Jane Weed Pomerantz. I'm with Positive Discipline Community Resources. For over 20 years, we've provided classes in the detention facilities for positive discipline for parenting and recovery and worked with the GEMMA program. We highly support the recommendations before the Board of Supervisors today and commend your uh, interest and efforts related to this issue. The children that we're talking about face incredible hurdles in their lives. And I wanna just draw the parallel to the many women and also men incarcerated. There's a child inside each one of them who are trying to contend with and understand and make meaning out of the trauma that they've experienced in their lives. So uh, it is a lifelong process. Uh, I just wanna say that without the stability and routines, um, and also continued encouragement, the children of those that are incarcerated do not have the ability to learn. The cortisol is surging through their brains and even if they are sitting in a, at a desk in school, they are likely not able to learn, to be uh, uh, successful students. So we have to be thinking about how this relates to a holistic approach and how it relates to um, the individualized needs of the people involved. Um, I, we support, as I said, we support the recommendations strongly um, and urge that in that holistic approach um, that we do a lot more to make sure that it's not a one stop, uh, this is your treatment and good luck, but actually that there's a con con continual and sustained effort uh, to help these, these <coughs> families. I know from my experience teaching those classes that it is an intergenerational problem. Those children, um, because of their distrust, because of their fears, because of their traumas, are likely to be repeating the same patterns that got them into, that got their parents into those chairs. Those relationship skills, for any relationship, require um, new understandings, awareness, and continued practice. So we do urge that you continue with educational opportunities for parents both on the inside and also once released to continue to learn how to rebuild those relationships that have been so severely damaged. Building the trust, solidifying the families, and helping them uh, re-enter civic society is a holistic uh, endeavor, and I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Hello, good morning. Uh, my name is Sophia. I am a survivor, and I'm a mother of two young children, um, ages two and seven months. Uh, after experiencing DV and needing to vacate my apartment for the immediate safety of myself and my children, in December of 2017, um, I have been unable to find stable long-term housing um, for, my, um, for my family in Santa Cruz County. This is through no fault of my own as I have been extremely diligent in my searching. Uh, transitional housing for women, particularly survivors, um, rearing families is a necessity in this area. There is um, simply not enough affordable housing available, um, even with resources. The current market value is far beyond reach. Women like me need a, f uh, a place to call home while rebuilding and healing. Uh, 
after becoming homeless or transitioning in and out or out of short-term shelters or on the streets. Um, rapid rehousing is not a bridge to stability, but perpetuates the cycle of homelessness. Uh, we need to aid them and uh, <coughs> women like me in their journey to becoming stably housed long-term and set them up t for success as members of the community. It is within your power to strengthen the lives of myself, my children, and many other women and families. I hope that you can help us thrive here. Thank you for addressing these issues. Hi, my name is Natalie Blackburn, and I've been involved in um, women's jail ministry with Peace United Church for eight or nine years. Um, the first thing that I realized I had in common when I started visiting women in the jail is being a mother and having concern for my children. And that is the number one thing that women talk about and cry about and pray, ask us to pray about is um, their children and that concern for them. They often have family members or ex-partners or their kids are in foster care and those um, in those situations they're often those people um, don't bring their don't bring their children to jail and to visit them. So the children also lose the right to see their mothers. Um, another thing that I realized I had in common with them is being a survivor of childhood sexual abuse and assault. Um, when I share that story at all, when I go to the jail, I have heard a lot of stories about um, their experiences too, including fear of being on the street because of the, um, the amount of rape and also gang rape that they experience, being afraid to sleep um, outside. Um, they, all, they often have to go back, to, if they ha don't have a place to live, people talk about their fear of not being able to stay clean because they have to go back to um, homes or family members who are using and also involved in crime. Um, they also ask us to pray about them being on the Gemma waiting list as a common theme, um, being able to um, get onto a drug treatment waiting list, or um, also a large proportion of them have mental health issues. And as we know, this is also um, a big concern in our community, is also a not, a not enough mental health treatment and mental health housing. Thank you. Hello, board. Um, thank you for your listening, and I just wanted to acknowledge the task force and all these beautiful men and women for standing for our future and our children's. And I also, too, want to acknowledge the bond between the mother and the child. And uh, when the parents are separated for the kid, kids, it's blatantly apparent um, the impact on the life and their future that's going to have. And uh, so I'm in support of uh, having uh, parental visitation with their kids and also a request that some of the uh, incarcerations and crimes are due to maybe uh, drug-related um, unusatory issues, and that can just be of a change of the way we see things. We can actually put people in rehab, not have it so criminalized, and offer help and services. Um, as well as CPS, um, it's been shown that when kids are taken from their parents with CPS, and there's been several other speakers that have spoke on this, um, it's more detrimental to the kid, and the kid is, uh, um, is that loss without the parent. Um, and so instead of taking away the kid, having structures in place uh, and um, help for the parents so that um, they, can, uh, they can then uh, <coughs> Excuse me, let me gather my thoughts. So that they can then uh, have predominant lives and all that. So that's a couple of requests. Housing was mentioned. I mentioned earlier this morning having like a place where people can go, like a, a sanctuary, they can pitch their tent, maybe have some rules, no drugs. Um, you know, you can be searched uh, to make sure you don't have anything on you, but a place where people can get back on their feet. Um, so if there's anything you can like really look into to like, you know, deregulate de all the stuff so people can be more free and expressed. That'd be awesome. And I just really want to acknowledge all these beautiful women here today. So, thank you. 
My name is LaFlora Cunningham Walsh. I live in the fifth district. Love it up there. Um, so I'm here today basically to support my family whose issues were brought up here today, as well as just to support the task force and say, just as one extra community member, I really, really value what they do. I really value the <coughs> recommendations that they put forth. I know that this board is a board that can take those recommendations and implement them and even improve upon them in the future. Um, I'd like to encourage you to fund this as properly as possible. Um, and yeah, it's just really great to see that this issue is being addressed. It's great to see they learn a little bit about the history here today. And I would really like to see that today be the day just like 2007 where some progress really gets made and 10 years from now when we come to address, address the next set of issues that today is a day that we can look back at as a cornerstone of our future all together. Thanks you guys. Hi, my name is Elisa DeKewag. I'm the clinical director of the Gemma House. First of all, I want to say thank you to the task force for the wonderful work that you're doing. It's really amazing. Um, I have only been working for the Gemma House for about seven months, and I've been working in treatment in Santa Cruz County for about a decade. And I was unaware of the unique capacities of the Gemma House. And I have to say, since working there, I am so floored by what we do. Um, we offer women a unique <laughs> place to heal from trauma, from all of the things that were mentioned here today. Um, we offer a place for them to heal from that and not have to worry about the heaviness of bills and we offer them a place to reunify safely with their children. So I would love to see another place like Gemma be funded. I would love to see more opportunities like this for the women in our county. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Katie Mayetta and I work for the courts. I am a social worker within the courts that's funded by a grant. I wanted to thank you guys so much for um, not only supporting this effort, but also financially backing and listening to all of the recommendations. Thank you so much to Susan Green for not only her passion and her research, but also for just continuing to keep this at the forefront of our minds. Um, the women that uh, I have the opportunity to um, work with are so inspirational. All of them have a heart in order to want to do better. That's not the issue. The issue is how do they get from where they're at to where they where they long to be. And that is the journey that we're talking about. We're talking about providing support, providing education. Most of the, uh, most of the people who are struggling right now have um, experienced trauma in their past. They are a child of parents who have been incarcerated. They are the actual patients that, that we are striving to serve who are trying to make it out of the criminal justice system. And we, we are asking for recommendations for housing, which I know is um, difficult, but we also need to recognize that housing is so much more than just temporary understanding or treatment. Some of the treatment that's provided is very um, limited, and a recovery journey takes longer than 30 days, takes longer than six months, takes longer than a year. And so when we're asking for these recommendations, we're also asking that the housing is housing with children. Their um, Gemma House is fantastic, but we also need an opportunity for these women not only to go into um, housing where they can be successful, but also that they can bring their children with them. As they, pr as they actually go beyond just finding housing, Housing, they're able to actually accomplish what they need to to reunify with their children. They they create a foundation to reunify with their children. Some of the housing opportunities that are there um, do not offer that. Do not offer the ability for them to even go beyond their trauma and be able to come become the parents that they want to be. Um, and so we're also asking that you consider those factors as we're talking about children and as we're talking about women. All of them need the support necessary, and I want to thank you guys for even um, just considering this and also making the steps necessary for this to um, really better our community as a whole. Thank you. Hello, my name is Lila and I'm 19. I've been um, through the foster care system and my parents have been incarcerated. Um, 
<clears throat> and I've also been homeless like for a long time through high school and I just wanted to say that there are a lot of young people who are homeless and even though we have programs like CPS, um, sometimes, you know, it's just not taken care of and um, Yeah, and I just wanted to mention that, and um, that these individuals who are young and trying to get their grasp on the world and figure things out, um, if things were, maybe went a little bit differently, maybe they wouldn't end up in a situation where they end up incarcerated or they end up being homeless in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria, and um, I'm very, I just first want to say thank you to everyone that spoke today, and thank you to Susan. I am on the task force. Sorry for the tears that are coming, but um, I also work for Monarch Services. I'm an advocate, and I am a mother and a grandmother. Um, when I I just have to just say that I hope you all had your ears open and really took all of this in because it's just not words. These are people's lives, women. Um, I have heard so many stories from women in my office. I have responded to women that just got out of jail that, was, that were out in the street and got sexually assaulted. I have seen more than I wish I would have seen here in Santa Cruz County. And I just wanna just say how thankful and fortunate I am working with such amazing people. I have, my eyes have just been open to so much more. And I just wanna thank you all for um, taking your time. Um, thank you so much. So I, I waited patiently. I heard the reports, heard the presentation, I heard the functionary bureaucrats, and I heard the design talkers call, come up in here. I'm well aware of this. Uh, you know, my sister raised Chad, right? <coughs> and you know, I consulted a lot of times with, with the foster care, you know, with my sister regarding the, the parenting. She said a lot of the parents were not, they shouldn't have kids, right? She did her best and she raised Chad and he's a good kid. You know, and I want to be able to say this. It's, it's interesting because as I listen to this, I just see the bureaucratic system want to expand, right? Want to invade the home and start taking care of the kids now and start acclimating them for jail, start taking them to jail. Our best bet is to deal with the, get down to the root of the, the problem and deal with the un, unintended consequences, political oppression. If we're not gonna deal with this oppression, how it's gonna, we're gonna bring it true healing. It's not just the women that need to be healed, it's the men, right? You guys wanna come in, divide the home, and then now you guys wanna assert the nanny state to come in and take care of the people. There's a lot, you know, on this panel, they, they don't have no Mexicans that are coming from the community, right? There's no faith-based uh, organizations back in this. We, 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 I would say, I would say they need, uh, they need real people from the community to be able to talk on this issue. I was patient enough to hear you guys, right? I'm offering a countervailing perspective, right? And that's, that's what debate's all about. Because I don't want to get, I don't want members of the public to get caught up in, in, in the demagoguing, because there's a lot of hardworking men and women that are struggling. We understand that the, that the gentrification is real, but we're not going to deal with that. We understand that the, that the criminal state wants to bring in the predatory culture and the punishing state. And yet the DA office and the sheriff department, hey, no one's dealing with that. You know, I'm going through a malicious prosecution. I got 130, I gotta go and deal with it, right? And there's a lot of men that need to be uh, reunited with their children. And, the, and there's men in jail that, that Chad needs his father, and there's a lot of other fathers in jail that need to be a part of their kids' lives so they can inspire them. Right, we understand housing's important, right? But the gentrification, it, it's real, you know? Well, I come in day in and, and day out in these meetings, and we hear it all the time, you know? 
Members of the public need to, we need to, we need to start reordering the public defender's office and have one organization that's gonna represent the people's political rights, human rights and civil rights, so that they're not dividing the families and they're not allowing the sheriff department to pick on them and not allowing the DA's office to pick on them and just divide and ruin the home. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Craig Wilson, under sheriff. I want to acknowledge the work of the uh, commission uh, we've been listening very closely, and uh, on behalf of Sheriff uh, Hart and myself, I just want to thank you for the work that you've done. Um, we wanted to comment uh, just briefly on the third recommendation about preventing sexual abuse in jails. Um, we certainly appreciate uh, everybody's interest in keeping our jails safe, and everyone, whether they're in custody or out, out of custody, and we work toward this. When Sheriff Hart learned that there was an allegation of an officer who uh, had abused someone in jail, he immediately started a criminal investigation that led to the arrest of the offender, an officer. He also conducted an internal investigation that led to sanctions against employees for reporting delays. But we didn't stop there. We formed a serious incident review board, which you've heard about, and uh, we wanted to include community members and people with lived experience. We included four prominent women uh, that work with the uh, Commission for Justice and Gender. We heard from investigators and prosecutors and considered best practices, and they came up with 10 recommendations. We're coming back on January 31st for an implementation report with that group. Um, so we do take these things seriously. Um, the board recommended that uh, we adopt body-worn cameras. We've done that, that we enter a contract with Monarch Services to, to have third party options for reporting for women in custody, and that we um, produce a video, which now is running daily, and other things. They also uh, recommended that a sheriff's detective is the most effective way to investigate all uh, claims and complaints in the jail, uh, and we support that. So I can provide additional information about the work we've done there at the request of your board, but I just want to acknowledge and again, uh, thank the commission for the work they've done, and thank you to the, to the board. Uh, for supporting the commission's work. Thank you. Thank you. That'll be our final speaker, and I'll be bringing it back to the board for action. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair. First, uh, let me express my uh, great appreciation uh, for all the people who participated in the Justice and Gender Task Force. Um, the, this effort has been part uh, college course, part support group, uh, part um, policy workshop. And uh, that I th think has been very helpful uh, because we didn't, the, the, uh, uh, Dr. Green at the beginning of her uh, efforts uh, laid out a, a, a map of different islands that we were gonna visit as part of this. Um, uh, and we started off on looking at trauma because we felt like that was important to uh, start at a place where we could look at some of the roots of the reason why people end up in our criminal justice system. Uh, and we heard from uh, lots of speakers. We heard from uh, women uh, who have experience in the criminal justice system. We heard from children uh, whose parents have been incarcerated. Um, we, uh, every meeting uh, uh, had uh, some readings uh, so we could be better informed, so we could have informed discussions. Um, the conversation was always very lively at these meetings, um, and when we sat down to sort of look at what we had done over, over uh, nine or ten meetings to, to come with recommendations, it was very thoughtful conversation in which there was consensus uh, on all, uh, all the items that are listed here. Um, one of the things that uh, I think is important uh, that we heard today and which should help drive uh, some of our work in this area is we aren't just talking about the an individual woman who's in the criminal justice system, which on average is about 20 to, 20 to 22 days uh, in our system. Uh, we're talking about all the other people in their lives, including the children. Um, when we hear from young people who've, who've experienced the trauma that has been created by the arresting of their parents, um, we think to ourselves, these are something that we could change. And we heard from law enforcement 
um, uh, representatives uh, from a number of uh, agencies, some who, who had written policies and some who identified that they needed to create written policies. And I think that is very important. Coupled with training and collecting data uh, seems to be also very important there. Uh, to think about um, this Bill of Rights, which the state has already adopted, but it should be prominently di displayed so people know what their rights are uh, becomes critical. And uh, to talk about something that seems kind of simple, that, that children should be able to visit their parents and that sh it shouldn't be just through a cage or a glass, but to, to have physical contact, to be able uh, to talk with them, to have that happen as soon uh, as possible becomes really important uh, to limiting the trauma uh, that that child is already experiencing seeing their parent go into jail, uh, possibly being placed in a foster home, having their life upended. Um, and when you look at the statistics of people who are in jail, who uh, I think the numbers are half of them had parents who were in jail. We're, anything we could do to reduce that number makes a big difference to the public safety of our community. On the issue of housing, uh, this is an issue which this board has taken very seriously and has worked very hard uh, to address a number of different elements to uh, increase the availability of housing. Um, this recommendation asks us to come and look at our own properties and try to see if we could use our own resources to, to address this critical need. When I hear from a mother who has been in jail, who's cleaned herself up, who has gotten a job, is ready to, to reunite with her family, but for the lack of housing, can't be with her children, and their children can't be with their mother, uh, it seems to me that we're missing out on a great opportunity to, again, bend that arc uh, to be able to uh, ensure greater or better outcomes for both the mother and the children. Um, this is going to require leadership on our part uh, because if sites are identified and uh, we not only have to back that up with some resources, but we may also have to back it up with our commitment to the, in the community because no one ever seems to like anybody who isn't like them um, uh, moving into their community. And when you say we're going to be, we're creating some spaces for women coming out of the criminal justice system so they can be with their family. Um, that, that may be widely accepted or it may need that we need to stand up and talk about the value of what we've learned uh, through the reports that have been presented to, uh, to this board and through this uh, task force. So I uh, encourage uh, my, all my colleagues to think about th this and be ready to, to show that leadership when the time comes. In regards uh, to the final uh, area, um, uh, when, we, when this was discussed within uh, the task force, there were uh, clear issues that were identified uh, by members of the task force about an independent uh, agent being the one uh, to do the investigation for all the reasons that were laid out. Um, this uh, becomes important for how it looks, but also how it would actually be uh, carried out. And I think it's important for us to ask the, the sheriff to consider that as part of um, uh, the work in addressing the, the, the outstanding work the sheriff has done to, to look at this issue. Um, I want to acknowledge that um, the sheriff office has been, has already in the, in the course of time that this task force has been meeting, has already done a number of great things, reopened Blaine Street, um, that uh, has created this division of reentry. Uh, that um, took suggestions about uh, guidelines about the video that uh, under sheriff, uh, uh, the under sheriff just talked about, um, and has been very committed to open dialogue um, and uh, presenting and being part of this uh, task force. The judiciary and the and the district attorney's office has also been involved in this uh, task force. And the fact that we, after a recent discussion about restorative justice, have been taken seriously, just had more conversations this morning with the D district attorney about this, uh, about the issue of restorative justice, could play a role in helping deal with the issues that women face in our criminal justice system. So the, the, to my fellow task force member, I want to acknowledge that having the conversation is already creating change. Um, and we are working with partners who um, share some of these same interests. The task force didn't drive all these changes, 
but the but the 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 county system is working to address uh, some of these pieces. Um, I want to thank uh, uh, Susan Green for her leadership uh, as part of this. Uh, she is uh, faced when when you take 25 years of experience and you say fit it into two hour increments over uh, that only happen once a month with uh, 20 people who may or may not all show up. Um, you have to really be thoughtful about how that's done and uh, be able to connect with people. And I think the richness of the conversation has ensured that most of the time we have almost everybody there. Um, and the outreach that Susan has done to make sure that people who aren't there are included even if they can't make it to the meeting makes a big difference. I also want to acknowledge uh, Nicole Coburn and Sven uh, Stafford uh, who have also attended every single meeting um, have uh, helped out with technical aspects of it, um, but I feel as though they are partners in this effort a as well, and I just want to recognize that. I, uh, Nicole has many years working uh, with the Sheriff's Department on budgets, and in her role as Assistant CAO has a broader um, um, uh, portfolio. Uh, but the time that you've committed to it and the time that Sven has committed to it has been really um, outstanding, and I want to thank you. I also want to appreciate the other departments uh, who have uh, put in time, HSA and HSD, who have already started looking at their own policies and programs to be able to address uh, these issues. Um, the task force is going to continue to meet. Um, and we have, there are other areas in which the task force is going to be taking a look at, and we'll come back to our, this board at the end of 2019 uh, with additional policy suggestions. But I think it says a lot for our board, made up of men who are committed to addressing the issue of women in our community, their families, um, and in a way that not only uh, helps uh, reduce recidivism, but increase public safety in our entire community. And with that, I would recommend uh, that we adopt uh, all the recommended actions and all the, all the different uh, 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 suggestions that are, are, that are in this report. Motion by Leopold, second by McPherson. Is there any I other just, discussion? I just wanted to ask uh, Nicole Colborn, uh, this the uh, number three, or excuse me, number four to identify the safe housing, uh, and that's a cooperative effort. Is that realistic? I mean, it seems like it should be, and uh, where we might be able to place uh, this type of housing. Uh, do you think we will be able to have this ready by uh, June? It seems like I think we should, and I surely want to make that direction as, if it needs a stronger support uh, motion of any type, but uh, do you think we can we can accommodate that? I think the preliminary report coming back in June um, will be fine, and we'll you know there might be future additional information that we need to re return to the board with, but we wanted to be aggressive and Good. provide an initial deadline in June. Good. Okay. Thank you, Greg. Yeah, uh, you, uh, the task force, you've really done your homework. I, uh, we, we need to get this information. And I, the, the thing that shocked me, you know, there were 31 interviews. They were all in, in the jail. And 30 out of the 31, if I read it correctly, were arrested on an average of 12 times before. Am I, is that correct? I think, uh, you got to come to the microphone if you're going to respond. I believe 30 of the 31 had been incarcerated before, an average of 12 times had been arrested before. Yes, that's correct. So then we get, <clears throat> I'll do this quickly. Then we're talking about once they're released from jail, how important it is to have the cooperation of, well, we have the probation department, then we have uh, child protective services, mental health, um, housing. I, I mean, uh, how is the cooperation, we, c we can help try to, to solve something in the jail, but then how is the cooperation once they get out of the jail? What's the, what would you say about you know, child protective services? The mom gets out, uh, the child was placed somewhere else for, I, I know they have hard work and, and all that, yeah. I would say that particularly family cases, 
and every case really is unique, right? These are individual lives. We know our own lives. Lives are complicated. There's a lot of different people and influences, so I can't really speak to that. I think that the division of reentry under Cynthia Chase's leadership at the jail is a direct effort at coordinating what you're talking about. Right. And you know, you brought up the uh, high rate of recidivism for women in our jails, and I know one woman talked about um, talked about it as these women are serving a life sentence 30 days at a time. Wow. So I think to to really recognize the rate at which so many people are cycling in and out for the reasons that have been discussed today, and the costs, both in safety and dollars, public dollars. I know we can do better, and so thank you. Yeah, and I, I guess with the child, a lot of times, the, no matter how ba bad the situation might be, <coughs> they want to be with mom, right? So how do you deal with that? I mean, this is going to be part of the Bill of Rights. Right. So I think that, again, every situation is unique, and there are some cases where it may not be legally or otherwise appropriate, but we can support healthy relationships with parents and children even if they're not always living together or have lived together before. So to where, when that is appropriate and, and legal and healthy, I think that there can be more done to support healthy relationships. And as we started, we know how important those relationships are. <coughs> Thank you. This is a very serious and sad situation that we're actually dealing with. It is uh, of utmost importance that we, we look at it. Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Zach? Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to actually compliment the people that, that spoke. It, this is not an easy forum to share your personal stories. I mean, it's, there's never an easy forum to share a personal story like this, but this is disproportionately difficult. And uh, you taking the time to share that is, is how change actually occurs, and you should be commended for taking uh, the time to do it and having the willingness to share that in this space. That means a lot. And the Commission's recommendations are practical, actionable, and necessary. And uh, it's important that uh, when recommendations come back, there's actually something real about them that can be implemented, uh, and they don't just end up on a shelf somewhere. And I think that uh, what came forward are those things. They will be action, actionable, not just for the Board, but for the community at large. And so I appreciate the work of the Commission for that reason as well. Thank you. Thank you. We have a motion on the floor. Uh, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? That passes unanimously. <laughs> that will... <laughs> it's a thank you to everyone here today and everyone who couldn't make it today who made this happen. Uh, this will adjourn our meeting to our next regularly scheduled Board of Supervisors meeting on January 29th.